Okay, live stream is up. PC recording done. Call recording started. Backup Thank is rolling. You. Thank you. Sergeant Sadowski, you may take it away with the opening. Okay, thank you. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Health, jointly with the Committee on Aging and the Committee on Technology. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council Dot nyc dot gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you. We are ready to begin. Thank you very much, Sergeant, and welcome everyone. I am Mark Levine, Chair of the City Council's Health Committee. I am very pleased to be co chairing this hearing today with my colleagues, Councilmember Margaret Chen, Chair of the Committee on Aging and council member Bob Holden, chair of the Committee on Technology. We'll be holding a hearing today to discuss New York City's COVID-19 vaccination program with a focus on access for seniors, a look at the profound inequality of vaccination and what we can do to address it, and the specific discussion of strategies to make scheduling an appointment easier for everyone. Just wanna take a moment to acknowledge our colleagues who are here with us. We have Council Member Mark Traeger, uh, we have Council Member Alika Amprey Samuel, um, Council Member Inez Barron, Council Member Keith Powers, Council Member Ruben Diaz, uh, Council Member Helen Rosenthal. And if I've missed any others, I'll come back to you uh, in a moment. New York City faces a continuing shortage of COVID 19 vaccine supply, despite what are now thankfully increasing weekly shipments. But many of the challenges of access and equity in our city's vaccination program are not merely the result of supply shortages, but the result of maddeningly confusing and difficult systems for making appointments, a failure to prioritize access for low-income communities, and delays in creating a program for homebound seniors, among other challenges. These are the topics of our hearing today. Scheduling a vaccine appointment in New York City currently requires navigating dozens of websites, each with its own system for registering, screening for eligibility, and setting an appointment. It requires hours of time, technology skills, and for most sites, the ability to read English. And of course, it also requires access to an internet-enabled device. Sitting and hitting refresh on your browser, hoping a vaccine appointment pops up has become one of the defining experiences of this pandemic. These barriers have had a pernicious impact on equity since the most vulnerable New Yorkers, including seniors and others, are far less likely to be able to run the online scheduling gauntlet. The scale of the resulting inequality is now painfully clear. After yesterday's publication for the first time of vaccination rates in New York City by zip code, the data shows striking disparity with as many as 15% or more of adults in wealthier, whiter areas already having received their second vaccine dose compared to as little as two to 3% of adults in low-income communities of color. This is a mirror image of the impact of the pandemic itself, which has resulted in fatality rates in low-income black and brown communities, which are five to 10 times that of wealthier, predominantly white areas of this city. These disparities should shock the conscience of our city. We need action, action to address this. We need to make it far easier to schedule an appointment online by creating a single, simple, multilingual website. A cater of text volunteers have already built useful tools to do this in a, rudiment, in a rudimentary way, proving that a better way of scheduling is indeed possible even without the resources of the city. But of course, you shouldn't have to follow a special account on Twitter to have access to a vaccine appointment. In fact, you shouldn't have to own a computer at all to have access to a vaccine appointment. And in fact, many New Yorkers, especially seniors, do not. 
So we need an army of staff, especially from community-based organizations on the ground, in communities making appointments, including by going door to door. And we need to reserve large blocks of appointments for people in the neighborhoods who are getting left behind by vaccination now. We should be doing more than just scheduling vaccine appointments door to door. We should be delivering the vaccine door to door for the large number of New Yorkers, including seniors and those with disabilities who are homebound and thus have no way to get to a vaccine site. Other parts of the United States are already doing this. New York City should too. We'll be hearing a variety of bills today to address these problems, including a pre-considered intro that I'm pleased to sponsor, which mandates the creation of a unified scheduling system for COVID-19 vaccinations. We'll also be hearing intro 2225, sponsored by Council Member Mark Drager, which will require the city to create a plan for vaccination of homebound seniors. We'll be hearing intro 1529, whose lead sponsor is Council Member Danique Miller, excuse me, Rezo 1529, which calls on the state to give New York City's Health Department the ability to implement critical policies to tackle racial inequity in vaccination so far. Finally, we'll be hearing Rezo 1529, which I'm pleased to sponsor, which calls on the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation to protect New York State's safety net providers and special needs plans by eliminating the Medicaid pharmacy carve out. As we will discuss today, the Medicaid pharmacy carve out will cause extensive harm to community health centers, safety net hospitals, and services for those living with HIV and AIDS. Given the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on the most vulnerable communities and the providers that serve them, we must not just delay the carve out or try to supplement it with, the, with uh, budgetary actions, we must eliminate this carve out. I very much look forward to our discussions today. And again, would like to thank my colleagues for being here. I also wanna thank the staff of the health committee, councils Harbani Ahuja and Sara Liss, policy analyst M. Balkin, finance analyst Lauren Hunt, and data analyst Rachel Alexandrov and Brooke Fry for all of their hard work to prepare for this hearing. Now, let me just check on other colleagues who have joined us. Let's see if um, you all have alerted me here. It looks like Council Member uh, Chaim Deutsch is here. And, uh, and I think we have gotten all of our colleagues. So now I'm going to pass it off to my co-chair in this hearing, the chair of the City Council's Committee on Aging, Council Member Margaret Chen. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Council Member Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. And I would like to welcome you today to the Triple Joint Oversight Hearing. I would like to thank my co-chair, Chair Levine, and Chair Holden for co-hosting this very important hearing with me. Over the past year, our conversation about older adults' health have centered on COVID-19, rightfully so. However, focusing solely on the contraction of the virus has led many of us to overlook other very important health issue harming our seniors due to the pandemic. So before I talk about COVID-19, <clears throat> I'd like to open with a disheartening reality of what many of our seniors have been enduring while so-called safely social distancing at home this past year. We already know that isolation in seniors has many health risks, <clears throat> including a 50% increased risk of dementia, and increasing a person's risk of early death. However, a recent study showed that as a result of both of the COVID-19 infection and COVID-induced isolation, different psychiatric symptoms such as depression, anxiety have emerged or has worsened in older adults. Additionally, COVID-19 isolation has disrupted the daily activities in which seniors were previously engaged, which has caused an acceleration of physical frailty, a decline of mobility, poor sleep quality, and physical inactivity for many seniors. This leads to a frustrated and unimaginable challenge 
for our seniors. While it is unsafe for seniors to be outdoors because of the chance of contracting COVID, it is also unsafe for them to be locked up indoors because of it. And this is why I've been a fierce advocate of safely opening, reopening our senior centers. Many seniors have spent over 300 days indoors, isolated. This is inhumane and like COVID-19, it's also harming our seniors' health. Now to COVID-19 itself. 1.3 million older New Yorkers are eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine, yet only about 280,000 of them have received at least one dose. That is less than a quarter of the eligible older adult population. This means that hundreds of thousands of older New Yorkers are still at risk for COVID-19 due largely to a systemic hurdles and inequities, many of which started way before the 21st century. Data show that in general, older adults are hesitant of the COVID-19 vaccine with just 63% of them reporting vaccine acceptance last month. Hesitation rates are even higher among Black and Latino older adults. This hesitancy is rooted in historical and medical injustice in this country, like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, which ran from 1930s to the 70s. Even more recently, there have been reports of New York City nursing homes administering older veterans experimental COVID-19 treatments without family members of awareness. This being the case, it makes sense that many older adults are wary of government issued vaccine. This cannot go unaddressed. In order to make sure our seniors feel comfortable taking the COVID-19 vaccine, we must be willing to address these past injustice and issues. I understand that the city is engaging in a robust effort to increase understanding and acceptance rate of the vaccine. But these efforts are not even addressing half of the issue we need to tackle to make the vaccine more accepted and accessible. I urge the city to take a more nuanced approach in making sure our diverse senior population know they can trust and should get the COVID-19 vaccine. Even for those older adults who are eager to get vaccinated, they are often unable to do so due to the registration hurdles. Currently, there is a mishmash of websites and hotlines that senior can access or call in order to direct to another website in order to schedule a vaccine appointment. It is frankly complicated and confusing. As we heard during our January joint hearing with the Committee on Technology, not every older adult has access to the internet or the technology needed to access vaccine registration websites. And not every older adult has an email to provide when registering through the city's hotline. Additionally, there have been reports of buggy registration website which have left many older adults spending hours trying to secure an appointment. Sometime even after hours of trying, seniors are left empty handed, unable to secure an appointment at all. On the other hand, when older adults are finally able to secure an appointment, they are often faced with another mountain of stress. How do they get to the vaccination site? Many vaccination sites are far away from the seniors' home, in locations foreign to them, leaving them without transportation at a disadvantage. These are not just simple problems. These are critical issues that are stopping our seniors from accessing a potentially life-saving vaccine. I know, of course, that the city has engaged in many efforts to increase the accessibility of seniors' access to vaccinations. Efforts like providing transportation to older adults, developing vaccination clinic in NYCHA, and launching several vaccine awareness campaign have been helpful, and we thank the administration work on these. I must say, I was pleased to learn 
that after much pressure from advocates and the council, the administration announced this past Friday that it is launching a program to vaccinate homebound older adults and will be expanding efforts to get home care workers vaccinated. However, while I'm happy for this initiative, I am disheartened that this is an effort that we had to fight for. Homebound seniors should have been a top priority from the beginning of vaccination efforts. Further, although this is progress, home delivery meal workers who provide meals and casework to homebound seniors are still ineligible to receive the vaccine. We cannot leave these important workers out of the vaccination effort. And I look forward to hearing how the city plans to address this. The administration also still have to, has more work to do to increase access to vaccines, including by using community-based organization, especially our senior centers as vaccine clinics. As I mentioned, many older adults are understandably hesitant of the vaccine. However, they trust their senior centers. Using familiar senior center as vaccination sites could help build their trust for the vaccine. And I've spoken to many senior center providers who have stated that they have the capacity and willingness to transform their centers into vaccination clinics. If this still isn't on the administration's plan, then it needs to be added now. At the end of the day, one of our top priority now must be to get vaccine to seniors and seniors to vaccine. I understand that getting all New Yorkers vaccinated is no easy task. And I commend, I commend the administration on its robust efforts so far. Nevertheless, we have more work to do. Let's get our senior vaccinated and safe. I'd like to thank the committee staff for their help in putting, putting together this hearing. Our counsel, Nusa Chidori, policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, finance analyst, Daniel Krupp, and finance unit head, uh, Johanna Sapora, and my director of legislation and communication, Kana Irvine. And I'd like to th thank the other members of the committee who have joined us today. Now I will turn it uh, to Chair Holden for opening remarks. Thank you. Good morning. I want to welcome everyone to our hearing. Uh, I am Council Member Holden, Chair of the Committee on Technology. I am pleased to join my colleagues, Council Member Mar Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging, and Council Member Mark Levine, Chair of the Committee on Health, to address equity, access, to the vaccine and uh, scheduling vaccination appointments online in New York City. As chair of the Committee on Technology, I wish to focus on the technological aspect of scheduling vaccination appointments. Obviously, immunization is a vital step towards stopping the spread of COVID-19 and returning to some sense of everyday life. The vaccine distribution in New York City started in December. Today, essential workers, people aged 65 or older, and people with chronic conditions are qualified to receive the vaccination. To book vaccination appointments in New York City, qualified individuals should either register online or call the special New York City vaccination hotline at 1-877-VAX-4-NYC. Unfortunately, not every eligible New Yorker has the opportunity to register online. So even now in the 21st century, some people still lack internet access or mo a mobile device. However, even people with access to technology experience difficulties during the registration process. I have heard and experienced an enormous number of complaints from my constituents who have found this online process challenging and even frustrating. And I can attest to that. Uh, late, lengthy questionnaires, multiple sign up systems and web pages, buggy websites and even, and even more have severely uh, hindered the online scheduling experience. Imagine being one of the people newly qualified to receive the vaccine. You go to the vaccine finder portal to find a vaccine provider and click one. Then you're sent on an endless journey 
of forms and questions asking you for medical insurance, proof of work, where you, you fill out uh, questionnaire after question to verify eligibility and identity. However, after this hours long process that so many people have struggled through, the website, website shows there are no appointments available. And, you know, that's happening as we speak. So now you are forced to start the process all over again and even with, and then try to get a new provider. So you, you go back and forth uh, the vaccine fighter portal and click on a new vaccine provider, but midway through uh, this separate registration process, the website crashes. So now you have to start all over again. Eventually you grow frustrated and give up. And frankly, folks, that's embarrassing to New York City. Access to a vaccine means more than just having bro a broadband connection and an internet device. It also means having the time, energy, and know how to navigate the ch this challenging online sign-up process. Fortunately, local software developers came up with a simple and easy uh, to do use website to help people schedule their vaccine online. Uh, TurboVax and Vaccine List. TurboVax was developed in less than two weeks and New York's NYC vaccine list only in five days. Both websites collect potential vaccination sites and let the user know upfront if there are appointments available or not. These are great efforts, but it's disheartening that a city with the tech resources and talent that New York City has could not design a better user experience for one of its most important websites. Even worse, several news reports show that City Hall did not tap into the immense tech talent they already have in various city agencies and offices. This is totally, totally unacceptable and there must be accounting for this. Uh, scheduling a vaccination appointment through the NYC phone hotline turns out to be, to not be an easy process as well. Uh, it is a lengthy series of prompts and holes uh, for, se for several minutes. Having to be subjected to this complex scheduling process repeatedly and often for no vaccine appointment is both disappointing and incredibly frustrating. It does not help that the dispatchers who are on the call probably use the same poorly city-run websites that residents have trouble with. So as um, more people become qualified for the vaccine, a proper, easy to use online system that is not merely a glorified store or locator is crucial. Uh, there is no question that we must ensure our New Yorkers receive their desired vaccines. So today's hearing is crucial. Uh, the city must work with the council, experts and community advocates to ensure that our seniors have the resources they need to connect. Our seniors and residents sh should have the uh, ability to schedule the COVID-19 vaccination appointments with ease, especially when we receive more supplies, which is any day now. Um, if we are to win the war against COVID-19, the city must embark on wartime efforts. Uh, we are not, not seeing this currently from this administration. So I would like to uh, recognize uh, council members that have joined us, uh, Council Member Eugene, Council Members Ayala, Ku, Yeager, Vallone, and Miller. Um, I would like to thank our wonderful technology committee staff, Council Irene Bohatsky, policy analyst Charles Kim, and finance analyst Florentine Gabor, and the staff of the Health and Aging Committee uh, for their hard work in preparing for this hearing. Also, I want to thank my uh, my staff, uh, Chief of Staff Daniel Cusina, Communications Director Kevin Ryan, and Legislative Director Craig Caruana. Uh, I now turn it back to Chair Levine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Holden. And now I would like to cue the Sergeant for the affirmation for our first panel of witnesses from the administration. Thank you, Chair Levine. We're now gonna turn it to council members who are present to make statements about their legislation. First, we will turn to council member Traeger. Council member Traeger, you may begin when you- Thank you, so sorry about that. Very excited to hear from our fellow co-sponsors. Please, council member Traeger. 
Thank you very much, uh, Chair Levine, uh, Chair Chin, uh, Chair Holden. I just want to also note that the leadership of uh, Chair Levine, Chair Chin, for our seniors and, and, and for uh, a fair, equitable vaccine uh, access and distribution has been exemplary. So I thank them both for their leadership. Um, government must be there for those who cannot be there for themselves. We need to step up. Um, I understand that we have a supply issue. I understand that New York State controls the eligibility process. What I don't understand, don't accept, is that we had months to prepare and center a distribution plan that centered equ equity and fairness uh, for seniors who need the most help. Um, we have outstanding senior service providers, as mentioned by Chair Chin, who know who the seniors are. They know where they are. They already provide meals, they provide medication and other types of services. And the fact that New York City uh, did not center a homebound senior vaccination plan at the start of this process is shameful. And my colleagues have already talked about how difficult and complex this issue is. I mean, if, if you are internet and tech savvy, this plan is for you. If English is your primary language, this plan has been for you. But for many New Yorkers who are not tech and internet savvy, for many New Yorkers whose English is not their primary language, this plan has not been for you. And if you're a homebound senior, very vulnerable population, which brings me back to the days of Sandy recovery when we had seniors in my district stranded for weeks without power, uh, folks who again were also left behind, this plan has not been for you. And the fact that I get calls and emails from people children of homebound seniors trying to help their parents, um, staying up at midnight or one o'clock in the morning navigating websites. Folks, we're not talking about looking for a PS5. We're not talking about looking for an Xbox. This is life and death. And, and I, I will say to you that I am full steam ahead on my bill intro 220, uh, 2225 to advance a plan, a fair, equitable plan for homebound seniors. Because even with the announcement that the administration rolled out, I remain concerned. I remain concerned that a number of homebound seniors have family caretakers as their primary caretaker. They're not included in eligibility. I'm also being told that the vaccine that some folks, that the administration plans to use for homebound seniors will be the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I've already heard from a number of folks in my district, I'm sure elsewhere in the city, that they're concerned about the comparison between Johnson & Johnson versus Moderna and Pfizer. That Moderna and Pfizer has over 90% or so efficacy rate compared to Johnson & Johnson. And they're asking, why don't they have access to the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine? Um, I am seeing that other parts of the country are moving forward with homebound senior plans using Moderna or Pfizer. And I understand that there's complexities in terms of transport, but you know it's the year 2021. We do have trucks with refrigeration storage capacity. I do think we have the ability to get this done. We are New York. Um, and so I am moving full steam ahead with the bill. And again, I thank the chairs for their leadership, for their time and really centering this issue at this hearing today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chair Traeger. We've also been joined by Council Member Ulrich as well as Councilmember Riley. And now I'd like to cue an additional co-sponsor of the legislation today, Councilmember Danique Miller to deliver opening remarks. Thank you, Chair Levine, uh, Chair Chen and Holder for, for the important uh, hearing that we're, we're, we're hearing today. And thank you so much for your, your leadership. Um, from the very beginning, this pandemic, the Black, Latino, and Asian caucus and other elected officials such as Borough President Adams and others have urged the city and the state to prioritize communities of color. After witnessing the appalling disparities in infection testing, we knew that vaccine equity would be an issue before the rollout even began. We've held uh, several press conferences even before the first day of the rollout, whether it was City Hall or Department of Health. People of color largely comprise our frontline essential workers, those men and women who keep our city running so seamlessly. 
and come from communities like District 27 in Southeast Queens. They are more likely to live in multi-generational homes and suffer from comorbidities. They are less likely to, in some cases, be insured and more prone to discrimination in healthcare, housing, finance, and education. In short, COVID-19 highlighted that grim reality our communities of color are underprivileged, marginalized when it comes to healthcare. We call for a real-time data-driven system to understand when, where, and how vaccines would be administered. But history repeats itself. Our cries were ignored by health, health authorities and executives. The results of communities of color, in particular, seniors amongst them remained under the vaccinate, vaccinated. To add in, injury to insult, affluent suburban communities make up nearly 25% of the vaccines dose, uh, doses delivered in the five boroughs. Granted, there have been some recent progress just over the past few days. Eligibility criteria has expanded to include comorbidities, mass vaccination sites around the city have popped up, including at York College in my district and have been announced. But more remains to be desired and a greater cooperation is required between state and the city um, in order to make this a reality. So I would ask that my colleagues continue to support our efforts and work with uh, the, the council continue to work collaboratively to ensure that we have vaccine equity um, wherever, wherever, whenever possible that we do all that we can to work towards that. I hope that my colleagues join me in the fight to make this vaccine easier, simpler and more accessible for New York, the most vulnerable New Yorkers. And again, thank you, uh, Chair Levine, for your leadership to uh, the co-chairs uh, that are hosting today as well. I'm excited about finally getting the work done, getting this voice out and look forward to serving New Yorkers so that we can get back to living. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Councilmember Miller and to all the members of the BLAC for standing up for equity today and throughout this crisis. I see we've also been joined by Councilmember Dr. Eugene, as well as Councilmember Diaz. And now I'd like to cue our committee counsel, Harbani Ahuja, to offer some procedural announcements. Thank you, Chair. My name is Harbani Ahuja, and I'm counsel to the Committee on Health for the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. For everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted and we thank you in advance for your patience. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. At today's hearing, the first panel will be representatives from the administration, followed by council member questions, and then the public will testify. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use a Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in the order in which you have raised your hands. I will now call on members of the administration to testify. Testimony will be provided by DOHMH Commissioner, Dr. J Dave Choksi. Additionally, the following representatives will be available for answering questions. DIFTA Commissioner Lorraine Cortez Vasquez and DUIT Commissioner Jessica Tisch, who will be joining at a later time. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Commissioner Choksi, Commissioner Cortez Vasquez, I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Choksi? Yes, I do. Thank you. Commissioner Cortez Vasquez? Yes, I do. Thank you. Commissioner Choksi, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Thank you very much. And good morning, uh, Chairs Chin, Levine, and Holden, and members of the committees. Uh, I'm Dr. Dave Choksi, Commissioner of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today and provide an update on the city's COVID-19 response as it relates to older New Yorkers in particular. 
As you heard, I am joined today by Lorraine Cortez Vasquez, Commissioner of New York City's Department of the Aging, uh, and Jessica Tisch, Commissioner of New York City's Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications. I wanted to start by thanking the Council for their leadership on this topic. We cannot achieve our aggressive goal of 5 million vaccinations by the end of June with a specific focus on older New Yorkers without your committed partnership to advocate for and to conduct critical outreach to the populations that are at highest risk for COVID-19. First, uh, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the lives and livelihoods lost to the COVID-19 pandemic. Too many of our family members, our colleagues, and our friends have been impacted and the continued rate of transmission is a somber reminder that though there is a light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccine, we still very much need to be vigilant and protect ourselves and each other from this virus. I'm honored to be here today to speak to the vaccine and the hope it provides and to the efforts being undertaken across this administration to create an equity-driven approach to make the COVID-19 vaccines safe free and easy for everyone. In order to be successful in this effort to truly turn a vaccine into a vaccination, we need to continue our focus on both enhancing access to and building confidence in the vaccine. As of today, New York City has already administered a remarkable over 1.3 million vaccine doses. Last week, we administered more than 317,000 doses. That's the most vaccinations in a single week since our effort began, amounting to one dose every two seconds. There are currently almost 400 vaccine sites open to the eligible public and listed on the city's vaccine finder, and more than 440 providers delivering vaccines to their eligible workforce, patients, or customers. As you know, in December, the Vaccine Command Center, or the VCC, was established to coordinate New York City's multifaceted efforts to promote and distribute the vaccine. The VCC, led by Deputy Mayor Melanie Hartzog, is an interagency effort that includes the three agencies represented here today, but also includes New York City Health and Hospitals, New York City Emergency Management, the Racial Inclusion and Equity Task Force, and all of the city's agencies. A core focus of the VCC's efforts is a commitment to reaching older New Yorkers. Among the populations currently eligible for the vaccine, older adults have acutely felt the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, facing the highest rates of morbidity and mortality. New York City is home to more than 1.29 million New Yorkers aged 65 and above. And although they have some of the highest rates of vaccine confidence, Reaching each of them does pose unique challenges. It is a critical population for us to reach. As we look at the COVID-19 statistics, it is older New Yorkers, specifically Black, Latino, and other communities of color who have been hospitalized and died at the highest rates. Therefore, in order to drive down morbidity and mortality, we must vaccinate our older New Yorkers at higher rates. <coughs> We are framing our work around three main principles, allocation, access, and outreach. With regard to allocation, the major barrier to making the vaccine available to more New Yorkers has been vaccine supply. The demand for the vaccine among eligible populations has significantly outpaced the supply allocated to New York City by the federal government. Mayor de Blasio, along with Governor Cuomo and lawmakers at the city, state, and federal levels have advocated for an increase to New York City's vaccine supply from the federal government. And along with other major metropolitan hubs around the country, we have advocated for an allocation that is not only proportionate to our population, but reflects the many non-New York City residents we vaccinate because they work in our city. Although we continue to face these constraints, Based on commitments made by the new Biden administration, we are looking forward to seeing increases to the city's supply. In anticipation of these increases, the city has aggressively pursued potential new sites, enrolled additional providers, 
and offered assistance to federally qualified health centers, independent pharmacies, and community-based providers. So we are ready to administer every dose allocated by the federal government expeditiously and equitably. In order to increase vaccine uptake among seniors who reside in one of the city's 33 identified racial inclusion and equity task force neighborhoods, we have begun to set aside appointments at city operated vaccination sites and have enlisted trusted community based organizations to schedule appointments during designated time slots. The city has also begun a program at New York City Housing Authority or NYCHA developments with significant senior populations to bring the vaccine closer to senior residents living at these developments. This effort is done in close partnership and coordination with NYCHA community centers and senior centers on site. We have been rotating to other NYCHA developments and will return to each of them to administer second doses to seniors who received first doses. We will continue to expand and refine these programs when we have greater supply to increase vaccine uptake among seniors in neighborhoods that have been hit hardest by the pandemic. In terms of access, limited supply unfortunately also restricts our ability to make appointments available because appointments cannot be released until we have vaccine in hand. Though appointments remain limited, we are focused on ensuring that eligible New Yorkers have access to them through a variety of means and in multiple languages. The city created the Vaccine Finder, an aggregation of New York City Health Department, Health and Hospitals, state and other vaccination locations that administer vaccine doses that have been allocated to the city. As I noted previously, almost 400 locations are open to the eligible public and more continue to come online. These can be found at nyc.gov slash vaccine finder. To accommodate more New Yorkers who may have limited to no access to the internet, we also stood up the New York City Vaccine Call Center to assist with scheduling appointments at city-run sites. All New Yorkers can call 877-VAX4NYC, that's 877-829-4692, for assistance in scheduling appoint appointments in over 180 languages. <clears throat> and for older New Yorkers who may need help getting to and from the vaccine sites, we've arranged free transportation options for those who are eligible. This can be arranged over the phone through the hotline for appointments at any vaccine site in the city. Additionally, last week, the mayor announced a three-point plan to vaccinate homebound seniors and the essential frontline home care workers who serve them. Part of that plan is the launch of on-site senior vaccination clinics in naturally occurring retirement communities known as NORCs and Housing Preservation and Development or HPD buildings with with uh, high concentrations of senior residents. With the anticipated FDA emergency use authorization and the arrival of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in March, we expect to stand up even more capacity to vaccinate all homebound seniors. Providing on-site vaccine distribution in these settings will build on our outreach to homebound seniors, including those for whom we've helped arrange free transportation to any vaccination site in the city and those whom we successfully helped vaccinate in long-term care facilities as a part of phase 1A. Additionally, over the next month, the city will aim to vaccinate 25,000 home health aides, offering dedicated, dedicated appointments in the areas where they live and work. Uh, we thank council member Amprey Samuel for her partnership of this effort in her district. <clears throat> and finally, I would like to speak to outreach. To further acknowledge the barriers that many seniors may face, the VCC convened the Vaccine Planning Work Group for Older New Yorkers, bringing together advocates and nonprofits specializing in supporting the unique needs of seniors, including working with DIFTA and its providers that operate senior centers, home delivered meal programs, and home care and case management programs. Through this forum, experts coordinate outreach efforts and vaccine distribution strategies for seniors, including the development of a transportation assistance plan and calls to share key vaccine information. The city has coordinated extensive outreach efforts, including door-to-door -door canvassing, public informational events, direct mail, 
robocalls, and assistance with scheduling appointments in multiple languages. DIFTA and their providers call thousands of older adults every day to share information about the vaccine, assist with scheduling appointments through the city's website, and arrange transportation to and from vaccination appointments for seniors who need it. This multifaceted effort working with all agencies across the city reflects our commitment to New York seniors, and we will continue to refine our strategies for reaching older New Yorkers. We understand that New Yorkers have had frustrating and challenging experiences with securing appointments. And that's why we are continuing to make improvements to our website and hotline interfaces as we get feedback from the council, providers, advocate partners, and the New Yorkers we serve to make each of them more user-friendly. We appreciate the feedback we have received so far toward these changes. <clears throat> now I will turn to the two bills that are being heard today. Uh, first, um, 2225, the Homebound Senior Plan. Intro 2225, uh, excuse me, Intro 2225 will require the Department of Health to establish a plan for the COVID-19 vaccination of homebound seniors and to report to the council on the implementation of such plan. We share the same goal as the council and the intent of this legislation, which is to vaccinate some of the most vulnerable New Yorkers. As mentioned earlier in my testimony, last week the mayor announced a homebound senior plan to get COVID-19 vaccines to seniors who have extremely limited mobility or cannot leave their homes. We can report to council on the specifics of the plan's rollout and the data on vaccinated seniors overall is currently on our site. Next is pre-considered T2021-7143, the Unified Scheduling System for COVID-19 Vaccinations. Pre-considered T2021-7143 will require the Department of Health to develop and maintain a unified scheduling system for COVID-19 vaccinations. Although supply remains our most limiting factor to get the vaccine to all eligible New Yorkers, we understand that there are also technology challenges to access vaccine appointments, especially for our older residents. Under the leadership of Commissioner Tisch and Do It, the city recently launched a website that allows New Yorkers to schedule vaccine appointments at city-run vaccine distribution sites. This is at nyc.gov slash vax, that's V-A-X for NYC. The content was made available in 10 languages through human translation and the forms have been streamlined to allow users to make appointments quickly and easily. We agree with the spirit of this legislation to streamline the systems available for New Yorkers to schedule appointments, and we will continue working toward that objective. As the administration announced this week, several providers have agreed to make their appointments available through the vax for nyc website, including certain locations run by Capsule Pharmacy, Northwell Hospital, and Hospital for Special Surgery, and the work continues to get more vaccine providers onto the system. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. While vaccines remain in limited supply, the city remains committed to vaccinating all eligible New Yorkers, specifically those that are 65 years and older. These are our parents, our grandmothers and grandfathers, and our neighbors. Together, we must ensure that there is access to and confidence in these vaccines in order to bring this public health emergency to an end. I appreciate your partnership and leadership as we move towards a citywide recovery. And we're happy to answer your questions now. Thank you again. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm now gonna turn it over to questions from the chairs, from Chair Levine, followed by Chair Tin and Chair Holden. Panelists from the administration, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you, Chair Levine, please begin. Thank you, Harmani. And uh, I wanna acknowledge that I think we've been joined by several additional colleagues. We have Council Member Rodriguez and Council Member Koo. And I'll acknowledge others if I missed you. But first, Commissioner, um, I, I'm so happy to see you. I think this is the first time I've seen you in public since you um, were very open about being diagnosed with COVID. And I just wanna ask how you're feeling. Um, well, thank you, Chair Levine. I, I appreciate that. Um, I am uh, I'm feeling uh, all right. Um, you know, feeling a lot of gratitude uh, for 
Um, the fact that I and my family members um, who uh, were ill with COVID-19 are recovering. Um, and for me, it was certainly a fresh reminder that um, the virus is still with us, that we're all susceptible um, and a renewed chance to appreciate just how much uh, uncertainty and um, anxiety, you know, it has brought to, to New Yorkers and our families. So, um, but thank you for asking, I'm recovering well. Well, that is great news and we're just grateful for your service to the city. And I think I speak for all of us in the council, we are wishing you a full and complete recovery as soon as possible. Uh, I, I wanna start by asking uh, a couple of questions on the website. Um, uh, a number of tech volunteers have created tools which list appointments available at virtually all providers in the city. So why hasn't the city been able to do that? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, we do know that uh, the, um, the uh, portraying of appointment availability um, is a very important part of how people actually navigate, um, whether it's uh, you know, the website or um, calling the call center to understand um, you know, whether appointments are available or not. Um, I do want to acknowledge again, as I know you have, that uh, supply is our limiting step um, to make many, many more appointments available. And we have no greater wish than to be able to expand the appointments that are available um, so that they are not uh, in such um, scarce uh, supply. Um, until then, uh, we are taking several steps um, to ensure that appointment availability is more clearly communicated, um, starting with the websites themselves, um, the vaccine finder, uh, you know, will uh, have additional information about appointment availability built into it. And then some of the specific um, city sites uh, have already been streamlined in a way that uh, denotes whether or not appointments are available at the time that someone is navigating through them. So we will continue to um, streamline and harmonize as much as possible, particularly with this eye toward conveying appointment availability. Thank you. And uh, I see we've been joined by our commissioner of the Department of Information Technology, Jessica Tisch. She's had a busy morning. So I'd like just to pause and ask our committee council to offer the affirmation to Commissioner Tisch. Thank you, Chair. Uh, commissioner Tisch, can you please raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Chair Levine, back to you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner Chakshi, uh, one of the most frustrating things for people, and this could also be a question for you, um, Commissioner Tish, but one of the most frustrating things for people seeking appointments is that you have to uh, complete a registration and eligibility screen on many sites to see open appointments. And that if you have to check back, which is mostly the case, you have to do that again and again and again. It's extremely time consuming and frustrating. Um, could there not be a system which allowed you to register once, explain your eligibility and perhaps your scheduling availability, and then just be notified as soon as an appointment is, is created? It would essentially be like creating a, a waiting list that would, I think, give, give people peace of mind that they were in the queue without having to constantly hit refresh on their browser. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I will start and then uh, turn it to Commissioner Tish. Um, and yes, you know, these are things that um, we have also uh, built into, um, you know, particularly the city websites with respect to um, making it uh, more clear uh, when appointments are available or not, um, so that people have that information, you know, before having to go through uh, the um, more detailed process of, of providing additional eligibility information. So that is one thing that has been streamlined and uh, has been brought up front um, in the process so that people are able to visualize that before spending that additional time to go through the detailed process in times where we have particularly um, limited appointments, uh, we have uh, operationalized, um, you know, uh, essentially a, a wait list where people can uh, put in their contact information um, and get reached out to when additional appointments become available. 
Um, with respect to the other part of your question, Chair Levine, um, you know, these are things that we are actively looking into as we uh, think about refinements to the various websites. One of the challenges is that um, eligibility uh, information and eligibility guidance, which is determined by New York State, as you know, is continually changing. And so we have to be able to accurately capture and reflect that in the information systems that uh, we're putting into place. Commissioner Tish, if you have anything to add, I'll turn it to you. Um, I actually thought that that was really thorough. Um, is there a follow-up question on that? Uh, well, th there's a new service and there's several like this that have launched to create waiting lists specifically to solve the problem of end of day doses. Uh, this is really a devilish problem because you don't want to throw any dose out mm -hmm. after the file is open, but um, it can be difficult in that scramble in the last hour to, or two of the day at a site to find someone who is eligible and is nearby and can come in quickly. Uh, and so uh, some services have launched, uh, one happens to be called Dr. B, I believe, that uh, allow you to register and provide your geographic location um, so that uh, if a site has end of day doses, they can alert people who say are in 10 minutes travel time and can come in in that last hour or two. And this would be another use of the kind of waiting list functionality I'm talking about. In this case, it's something being built by uh, a private provider. Um, is the city planning on plugging into that service or creating one or, or partnering with another uh, service like that to solve the end of day problem. So it's I funny that you mentioned that um, company because I spoke to them last week and have another follow up meeting with them today. That's not to say for sure that that's the direction we're going in. Um, we do have our community based organizations that we work with at each of the sites who have been um, helping fill the end of end of day slots. I think as supply increases, there will be more of a use case for the type of service that you were recommending and, and the wait list function like that. But at this time, um, we, we don't have the supply to really operationalize anything like that. And I'll, I'll just add um, briefly, Chair Levine, if I may, um, that the, the problem you know, that you're pointing out um, that we uh, are solving is ensuring that, um, uh, that all doses are used. When uh, a vial is uh, punctured, um, you know, it has to be used within a certain time frame. Uh, and so we do have detailed protocols that already exist across uh, all of our sites, um, certainly at our city sites. Um, and this is true at non-city sites as well, because it's part of the um, state guidance for the vaccination program to ensure that there are wait lists in place. I'll just underline one of the points that Commissioner Tish made, which is we do wanna ensure that um, these doses as far as possible, uh, in addition to using them, they're being directed in a way that is um, consonant with our equity goals. Uh, and so we have been working with community-based organizations in generating those wait lists of eligible individuals and particularly looking uh, to ensure that it's people who are from the surrounding communities of a vaccination site. So these are important things to make it so that uh, we don't solely rely on technology, but also, um, you know, rely on uh, those community-based relationships to be able to fulfill those goals. Thank you. And, and how far out are you scheduling appointments now at city-run sites? And does the fact that supply, in addition to increasing, thankfully, um, since the Biden administration took over, is actually more stable and predictable, uh, which is uh, an important uh, improvement, given that uh, can we not schedule out much farther into the future, maybe even even a couple of months? Thank you for the question. Um, so yes, it is true that supply um, has started to increase. I will point out that it, it has been modest and gradual thus far, but it's helpful that it has uh, increased slightly. Um, and also, as you pointed out, that we have visibility, not just for this week's um, supply for New York City, uh, but for a three-week window. 
with that said, um, the state uh, guidance, which we have to follow, is that we cannot release appointments until we actually have vaccine doses in hand. Um, and that's to account for the fact that, you know, as we have seen in previous weeks and as we're seeing this week with inclement weather, there may be some uh, delivery delays. Uh, there may be other things that have to be taken into account. And we want to minimize um, the burden on New Yorkers with respect to having to reschedule or cancel appointments. Um, and so uh, particularly at city sites, but this is a broader requirement, um, appointments are are only released when we actually have supply in hand. Thank you. You talked about the increasing number of places where people can get vaccinated and, uh, and it's, that's great news, but it's uneven. And there, there are parts of the city where there are very few vaccine sites. If, if for example, you are an essential worker in uptown Manhattan, uh, let's say you deliver food for a restaurant and you're under 65, and you live in West Harlem or Washington Heights or Inwood, there's no local site where you can get vaccinated. And uh, to my knowledge, there's no site that would give you geographic preference or any other preference in other parts of the city. Um, this seems like the perfect situation for the health department or the public hospitals to jump in and open up uh, a community-based site. Uh, the kind of thing that I hope we would start to see in NYCHA community centers, uh, in houses of worship uh, all over the city to be close to those who are getting left behind now. Uh, what, what is the city's plan to, to fill in uh, what you might call vaccine deserts, parts of the city where they're underserved and where we're seeing it, unfortunately, in the lower rates of vaccination? Dr. Chakshi, did you want to take that? Looks, looks like we have a, a mute issue. Okay, back. It might be on our side. Can we make sure? All right, I think we've got it. I think right. we've got it going. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so yes, thank you, Chair Levine, uh, for that question as well. Um, let me just clarify that um, that this is already happening. You know, with respect to uh, the siting of vaccine uh, locations. Um, we think uh, very uh, deliberately and we use the same data-driven approach that we have brought to all of our public health response with respect to ensuring um, that there's access to vaccination uh, in the, the places, you know, the communities um, that most warrant it. Uh, and so um, that's reflected in the fact that the significant majority of uh, city vaccination sites are in um, the, the neighborhoods um, that are designated by the Task Force on Racial Inclusion and Equity, um, particularly for health department sites. Um, when we were uh, deciding upon where to um, place uh, the city vaccination hubs, um, that was with an eye toward those hardest hit communities as well. Um, health and hospitals, as you know, um, already has a very community-based approach um, and is leveraging their entire infrastructure, not just hospitals, but other community-based points of care um, to deliver vaccination as well. We are actively looking at places where there may be gaps. Um, you know, there are over 400 uh, sites that are open to any New Yorker who is eligible and another 400 plus uh, that are open to eligible patients, you know, or other uh, people who may be served by uh, vaccine providers. And so we do have um, many, many points of access and the ability to stand up even more capacity quickly. Again, our limit here in being able to do that um, is with respect to supply. As you see that start to ease further, you will see um, capacity and points of access continue to increase concomitantly. Thank you. What portion of the appointments being made at, at city-run sites are being made uh, through the various channels, web-based, phone-based, and in-person? In-person would be through community outreach by community-based organization on the ground, or in some cases by city workers who are out there uh, in, in impacted neighborhoods. Um, I don't have a precise breakdown that I'm able to share uh, at my fingertips, but what I can tell you um, is that it is a bit uh, difficult to tease this apart because um, it may be the case that someone calls the call center 
um, and they actually use you know, the website to help uh, a patient book an appointment. Um, the approach that we have is that there should be no wrong door with respect to making an appointment. Uh, if someone is able uh, to um, have internet access and use the website, we want them to be able to do that um, seamlessly. Uh, if someone prefers to pick up the phone and talk to someone in the language of their preference, um, we've made it uh, you know, uh, as simple as possible for them to be able to book an appointment that way. Um, we know that in some cases it will take human relationships, you know, the people that, um, that patients already trust, uh, whether it's a community-based clinic or a community-based organization. And so we've also opened up channels for appointments to be booked in that way. Yeah, so anecdotally, it appears that a very, very small number of appointments are actually being made by on-the-ground outreach and even, even fewer by door-to-door. -door. I don't know the number. It would be great to know but there's equity at stake there because as, as we've spoken about, there's just a large number of people in the city who are never going to go onto Twitter and follow the right bot or even go onto the web because they don't have a computer or they have other limitations. And for them, we have to go to where they are in their neighborhoods, in their homes. And I know the city's doing some of that. I just don't know how much. And so actually getting the numbers on that would be very important. But I just, in one final question, uh, though we're focusing on vaccination today, we can't ever forget that there's still an ongoing threat day to day of this virus. Uh, you yourself, Commissioner, as we were speaking about, unfortunately tested positive. Uh, we're glad you're doing better. But about 4,000 people on average are testing positive every day in the city. So that, that uh, is an extraordinarily high number. But I, I just want to ask about uh, an emerging threat of the variants. And if you can update us on just how many samples are we sequencing a week in the city? And how many of the key variants have been detected, particularly uh, so-called B117, which is a um, first detected in the UK? Uh, there's been very little public reporting on that. So maybe I'll give you an opportunity now to tell us just how many have been detected um, and what trends you're seeing there. Yes. Well, first, um, Chair Levine, I want to thank you for continuing to call attention to this. Um, we cannot take our eye off the ball. Um, with respect to what's happening uh, with the spread of COVID-19 in our communities. Uh, even as we do ramp up our vaccination efforts, um, we have to remain laser focused on everything that we can do to mitigate um, the effects of COVID-19 today. Um, and you've been a real partner in ensuring that New Yorkers have uh, the guidance that they need um, and also that we maintain our attention on it, especially in a moment like now. With respect to the variants, um, let me start by saying that I am uh, quite concerned by what we are seeing um, with respect to the new COVID-19 variants, both um, the evidence that we have from around the world and around the United States um, and uh, growingly uh, you know, closer to home, uh, whether it's surrounding states, um, elsewhere in New York State uh, and here in New York City. Um, thus far of the different um, variants of concern, the one that has been uh, confirmed to be detected in New York City residents is the B117 variant. This is colloquially known as the UK variant. Um, and there were 18 uh, confirmed cases of the B117 variant uh, that we have previously announced. Um, we have not uh, as yet detected um, any of the other variants of concern, specifically the B1351 or the P1 variants in New York City residents, although we are actively monitoring for both of those. Um, we do plan to uh, share um, additional information at a regular cadence with New Yorkers with respect to what we're seeing um, in terms of the uh, the specialized uh, genetic testing that we do to identify those variants. Um, I'm pleased to say that New York City, thanks to our public health laboratory and other labs, does have um, the capacity uh, to detect those variants. Um, we are currently doing that for hundreds of samples a week. Uh, and over um, the course of February, we will further ramp that up um, with respect to our surveillance capacity. So um, that's what uh, I'm able to share at this moment. Um, and please know that as we compile 
and analyze uh, the information from the various sources, you know, the various laboratories that are doing this specialized testing. Uh, we will be sharing more about those uh, in coming days. Okay, you cited a figure of 18 detected, <clears throat> excuse me, of B117, but that was uh, announced two weeks ago. So have there not been any new cases detected of that variant? We, we check these at a um, particular frequency with respect to coordinating with um, the partners. And so the update for uh, this week remains to be compiled and analyzed. Uh, and we will have more information to share about that uh, sometime in the next uh, couple of days. Okay, this is, this is really important because the public is in the dark right now about whether and how fast any of these variants are spreading here. And, uh, and it really will inform, I think, our messaging uh, and may inform decisions about reopening and lifting of restrictions, et cetera. So this is really important and we definitely need real time updates on it. And, and last clarification. So you said we're doing hundreds, we're sequencing hundreds of, of, of samples a week, but if we have 4,000 new positive tests a day uh, or averaging over a seven day week, uh, what you're citing sounds like a very small percentage. I mean, maybe 1%. Is that a fair approximation that we're only sequencing 1% of samples? Um, it, the number is higher than that. Um, we will have the precise figures, you know, to be able to share with that additional uh, release of information. Um, but it is higher than 1%. Uh, we have a goal um, to, uh, to sequence, um, you know, significantly greater uh, then 1% on the order of 5 to 10% uh, or potentially even higher with more time um, so that we do have uh, the right window into uh, the variants in New York City. But allow me to take the opportunity to just um, convey, you know, to your point, which I very much agree with, um, that we should be concerned about these variants. It means we have to renew all of our efforts with respect to what we know works, whether it's uh, COVID-19 um, that we are more familiar with or one of the new variants. Um, the things that work are wearing a mask and wearing it properly, um, doing the physical distancing, uh, you know, trying to keep uh, six feet apart, staying home if one is feeling ill, washing your hands frequently, um, and then getting tested regularly as well. Those are all the things that we will continue to emphasize because we know it works, whether it's for the new variant or for the older strains. Thank you uh, very much, Commissioner Chakshi. We wish you continued health. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Tesh. And I'm gonna pass it back to Committee Council Ahuja. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm now gonna turn it to questions from Chair Chin. Um, thank you. I have a couple of questions for, um, the Deputy Commissioner, Commissioner Cortez Vasquez. Great to see you again. Um, Thank you. I know in last month's hearing, um, Commissioner Chachi, glad to see you. Hope you get stronger soon. Um, Dr. Chachi was talking about how the, you know, vaccine is not stable and transporting, because I was asking a question about our senior center. And I just want to get back to that. Because this weekend, I had a great example of how a senior center in my community, and this was from the state. And, and it's like, how did the city and the state coordinate? This came down from the governor's office. Like, oh, I'm going to set up two sites in your district, right, to take care of some seniors. And one of the sites, which is a senior center, a, a North program, Hamilton Madison House, they called over 400 senior to schedule appointment. And it was very orderly. Um, I had a staff who's a senior, uh, elder senior, and I was able to get her an appointment. And she said they called her and they emailed her to confirm, to schedule. And when she was online, there was somebody who speak different languages, you know, Chinese, Spanish, English. Um, and the form was only 10 questions. And it didn't ask about immigrant status. Uh, it didn't ask about um, health insurance. It was just basic question. Do you have COVID symptoms? And 
another uh, question, 10 questions, and that was it. And afterwards, she got a card that said, you know, you got the vaccine on this day, and it was Northwell. And they gave her a card to come back to the same site in three weeks to get the second dose. It was so organized. Why couldn't we, I mean, we should be doing this at every senior center, every Nork building. That's what, how we take care of our senior, right? We call them, we help them schedule appointment so they don't have to go crazy on that hotline or on the website. And they know our senior center. I mean, over there, they didn't have any big refrigeration, right? Refrigerate, whatever that was needed, but it was the site that was able to take care of a few hundred seniors. And it was a very good experience. Why couldn't we duplicate that? And we should be ready, ready with every senior center. Last month's hearing, I heard from the deputy commissioner, we surveyed and we found a hundred sites. Uh-uh. I mean, DIFTA has over 249 and, and we have 10, almost 300 centers. Those should be ready when the supply comes. This should have been a priority in the beginning, but I know, Commissioner, you work very hard to advocate and sometimes the city forget about the senior. I know, you know? I mean, that was the same food with the Get Food program. They forgot about the seniors. But a lot of seniors now are connected to the senior center because of the Get Food program. And the senior center has been calling seniors on wellness check. The infrastructure is there. So when the supply come, I wanna make sure that the seniors are the priority. They're the 60, over 65, 75. I mean, this weekend, I just lost another senior in my district, an elder who was well-respected, was over 75. He didn't get the vaccine. We lost him. And, and, and it's happening across the city and that is unacceptable. So commissioner, I just wanna hear that, how is that set up now that we have these center, how many centers do you have ready, ready to do this? And when I heard uh, commissioner Chachi talk about North program and HPD, what about the HUD 202 senior building? How many of those are we included, right? I just wanna make sure all these seniors who are there are gonna get taken care of. And we have these nonprofit service provider who's ready to go. They are ready. We just need the supplies. Um, Commissioner. All right, so first of all, I wanna go back to something that Dr. Chauxi said earlier, right? And Dr. Chauxi said about this is a cross collaboration with all city agencies. And we have, as you well know, been advocating for senior centers, again, because of service deserts and because of equity issues, we are all on the same page with this. Um, and we have, provided to the vaccine command center, uh, a list of areas and community centers that are being looked at. Um, as Dr. Chotsky said, um, Chotsky said so clearly, we have 400 sites and every day we're looking at new sites. And that's what we're doing. There is no, as, uh, and I, I love the phrase, there is no wrong, no wrong door for access. We're trying to create as many doors as possible. So every time we hear something from the network, from you, uh, first of all, I applaud that experience. And I'm glad that Madison Hamilton was able to get that kind of experience. And that experience I want you to know is replicated in lots of other sites. That same process you talked about where someone goes in, it's orderly, you go there, they ask you a series of four or five seven questions, no one asks a status question or a documentation mm -hmm. question at any site or anywhere in New York. So, and, and, you, and if you get your first dose, you get a card that gives you a date for your second dose at that same location. So you leave with a sense of confidence also. Um, 
So that whole process you described as it's what is occurring at our 400 sites. Um, of course, there will be glitches and everything happens because you know we're all dependent on, on human on, 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 on each other. And so it doesn't always work perfectly, but I, would, I, I can tell you confidently that that is the practice and the process at most of the sites, most of the time. And we are all working alongside with you, uh, Councilwoman Chin, as, as eagerly as you are, we are in terms of opening as many sites as we possibly can, particularly those that have trusted voices and trusted partnerships. And we're doing that real time. All of that information goes to the Vaccine Command Center they do a review and then will designate sites. So I, I, I share your frustration sometimes, but I want you to know we all share your frustration. There's not a commissioner on this panel that doesn't share that frustration, but we're doing everything to make sure that we have as many sites as possible uh, going on. And Dr. Chotsky, would you, uh, Chotsky, would you like to, I keep doing that to you and you pronounce my name so perfectly, I'm almost embarrassed. I am embarrassed. <laughs> That's, um. <laughs> that's, that's quite all right, Commissioner. I, yes, I'll just briefly add to your answer, um, which of course I wholeheartedly agree with, to say, um, well, first, Chair Chin, I wanted to just acknowledge um, both, you know, both of the stories that you told uh, just describe in, in uh, vivid illustration, uh, both what um, we are striving to do, and as Commissioner Cortez Vasquez described, are doing across so many of our sites already, um, but also the challenge that we have remaining um, with respect to getting to uh, the other um, senior New Yorkers who remain to be vaccinated. The things that I wanted to add are one, to just assure you, um, both as a doctor and a New Yorker, that seniors are centered in our vaccination strategy. I believe this for the simple reason that um, not just because they deserve that protection, uh, but as a doctor, I know it's what will save the most lives and prevent suffering uh, for us to do everything that we can to expand um, access in the ways that, um, that you, I know, share. And the second thing that I just wanted to add is that um, we are poised and ready to be able to do that. One of the principles that we started with in our vaccination campaign was the idea of meeting patients where they are. That means doing the type of proactive outreach that uh, DIFTA has done under the commissioner's leadership uh, to actually reach out to older adults. It also spans all of the work that my department has done with health systems and clinics to encourage them to reach out proactively, um, as well as setting up those uh, vaccination clinics at HPD developments, NYCHA developments, senior centers, you know, we are, we are uh, poised to be able to expand that out even further, but it does hinge on our getting an adequate supply of vaccine to be able to do all of those things. So if the vaccine shows up, let's say on Monday, are we ready? I mean, like how many senior centers are gonna be open to do the, the vaccination? I mean, do you have a concrete plan in place with the provider saying that the vaccine comes, you're the next one to go. So they could start calling senior and scheduling appointment. So it's kind of like, what's the, the plan of action so that people are, getting ready to get, get those appointments um, and be ready to get vaccinated. It just, it seems like it's just like here and there. And I mean, when I go back to the coordination between the city and state, I mean, when the state announced that they're gonna do this, do they tell the city that they're doing this? I mean, it was last minute, we got a call from the mayor, I mean, from the governor's office, we're doing this over the weekend. You're gonna get two sites, one site on Saturday, one site on Sunday. Did the city know about it? I mean, come on, you know, it's kind of like, why is the state butting in <laughs> and not coordinating with the city? That's a frustration um, that we have. 
right? Just give us a vaccine and let the city do it. And you know, and diff the commissioner, I mean, seniors should be in the front of the line. And I, you know, we hear all these big play, you know, big 3,000 dose plays set up in Yankee Stadium and, and all this happening, yeah, for the general public. That's great. But what about the seniors? Now, I don't hear, a, I don't see a plan. I mean, the, the mayor talked about the plan for home, homebound seniors, it's like wait for the Johnson. Uh, that, that's not a plan. How come then we're not getting the same, same vaccine as everybody else, right? It's like some of the homebound seniors, they could take the elevator down to, uh, to the community uh, space in their building. Why not? I mean, that, that should be ready. Like, wh which is the, the, the 10 building that are already set up. So people are already prepared to call the seniors and, and get them ready, right? I mean, that, that, that should, that, that's what I don't hear, that there is a plan in place. Like which one are ready to go so that providers know that, okay, I'm gonna get the phone list together and we're gonna make sure that we have enough staff on hand, we're gonna start calling, right? We just don't don't see the 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 concrete plan in place. I we have a list of all of the NYCHA senior centers that are available. We have a list of the North senior centers that are available. And yes, we have looked at all of the SARA and HPD older adult sites also. And we can give you the list that those are currently available and we can give them to you by borough. And, uh, and the overlay of the 33 equity districts. And I will make sure that you get that immediately after this hearing. Um, yeah, I mean, so the there, is a plan. Really, there is a plan. Have... If when, when, uh, when uh, the vaccine is available, as Dr. Chalksky said earlier, the state says that we cannot release appointments until that time. The sites that are currently open and available are immediately um, able to start making appointments, right? So there is a plan in place. Is the plan as widespread as we would want it to be for older adults? We're working on that every day. Yes. Well, I just want to. Yeah. I just want to see like the list. I mean, like. I will send. For, I will for make for sure that. You will get that list. And there have been many example and pilot programs that have been set up, you know, through other through other opportunities, just like you talked about Hamilton Madison. I will also get you the list of all of those that are dedicated to older adults. Dr. Chotsky, sorry, I cut you off. No, it's true. No, no, I mean, they, there's like some that maybe they have their own connection that they're able to contact uh, the governor or contact a a private, you know, health provider uh, to do that. But as a city, we want to make sure it is equitable so that every community, especially the community who need it the most, yeah. get it. And that's the city's responsibility. And there should be already a list, you know, plan in place, which are the one that will be set up next week when the, the vaccine is available so that we do see a concrete plan and the city and the senior have some hope in mind. It's like, they're not gonna be spending hours and hours trying to schedule an appointment that's miles away. Meanwhile, they could just go to their senior center that's a block away. And, and that's what we wanted to see. And even with the, the home care, the homebound um, senior, we, I talked about in my opening, you know, the worker that deliver, deliver the home deliver meal. I mean, they also should be you know, in the priority list because they have the direct contact with the senior and they could also be helpful while they're delivering the meal. They could give them information about how safe the vaccine is and how they can, you know, call um, a local CBO that can help them schedule an appointment without going through the city hotline. So, I mean, those things are, those infrastructures are in place and we want to make sure that these workers are also being taken care of because they have the direct contact also. Yes, thank you for highlighting all of these important points. Um, I just wanted to add a little bit in terms of you know our response to them. 
um, to, uh, to again emphasize that um, these are uh, elements of the plan um, that we have uh, put in place um, with a focus on uh, seniors, but with a particular focus on older New Yorkers um, who are in uh, the task force neighborhoods as well. Um, we wanna do it in a way that takes advantage, not just of the city infrastructure that you have described well and that you've pointed out, uh, for which as Commissioner Cortez Vasquez has pointed out, there is a plan for us to be able to expand out um, as supply grows, um, but uh, perhaps equally importantly for us to partner with um, other trusted organizations and clinicians in those neighborhoods. Um, you know, I know as uh, you know, someone who um, has had a clinical practice that involved uh, many older adults that um, they would rather hear from me um, with respect to you know, reaching out and uh, making it clear why I believe they should get vaccinated, how they can get vaccinated at a place where they're already familiar with you know, navigating and actually you know, traveling to if they're able to, that has the accommodations in place for people who may have limited mobility. And so we are um, very invested in leveraging those existing relationships as well. Whether it's a federally qualified health center mm -hmm. or an independent neighborhood pharmacy where we know a lot of our seniors go for flu vaccination, for example, um, or uh, some of the places that you have pointed out, um, you know, like senior centers. So the goal is always to meet patients where they are and to leverage those existing relationships because that is where we know the trust already exists in communities. So there is a lot that we will do as a city, but please know that we'll also have the humility to say we want to work with others because that's the way that it will be best received by the people that we aim to serve. That's good. I mean, that information needs to get out. And I think it would help, you know, if all the council member, if we have that information, we can help, you know, get it out to our constituents. The problem is it's a lack of information. We have seniors who were calling my office, calling me personally and said, I call, you know, this doctor, that doctor, and they said they don't have any uh, available or they call the clinic and, and it's not available. So if we know all the places that are available and when you know, senior calls us, and we can at least help guide them. And I, I know the, the robocall that the commissioner make and I'm helping also, at the end, it tells the senior, if you have trouble on the website, on the phone call, call your senior center, call your local senior center and local senior service provider. So it's still back to people that the seniors trust, which is their local senior centers and the people that Oh, caregivers and and so that's why the senior center we got to give them credit their staff and give them the information so when the senior call them they can help them and then they're, they're doing that so just utilize the infrastructure that we already have and we can get to a huge number of senior right away so i just hope that you know we we continue to do that and please you know share the plan with us and share the information with us so that we can also help uh, publicize it. So I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Chair Holden uh, for a question. Thank you. Thank you to both commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Chen. By the way, uh, I wanna echo everything you've said about the senior centers being used as uh, vaccination sites. That is a no brainer and that should be set up immediately and, and we're funding them. Why not open them up and use uh, make some good use uh, out of them at this point but let me uh, let me go on to uh, just some observations first uh, I'd like to ob obviously uh, Jessica Tish the commissioner of do it uh, is on and um, I know you've uh, improved uh, you have a new and improved website uh, that you've uh, helped uh, work on the uh, uh, vax for NYC uh, and we tried this morning, by the way, to register someone eligible and, and we hit a roadblock. Um, obviously no vaccines are available, but I think it was, there was a lost opportunity because it just said no vaccines available. We weren't able to register our cell phone or email 
or have the city text or email us when a vaccine is available, much like your your new and improved 311 site does. I mean, I, I had some complaints last night about illegal parking and I got a bunch of texts, sent a photo, did everything that was, you know, that I was supposed to do and really got great communications from 311. So I want to thank you for that. But why can't we do the same with um, that uh, Vax4 NYC? Um, we can, and we at various times have had signups for like email us, email me when uh, more appointments become available. The fact of the matter is that waiting list, that list got so long that it was just as not just as long, if not longer than the entire amount of vaccine supply that we had in the whole city. Forget just, you know, the, the share that, that, that the sites um, got. And so it's a tough call, right? Do you say to 150,000 people, hey, I'm gonna notify you when we get 25,000 slots? Yeah, so I, I can see, I can see that's, that's a very yeah. practical reason, but, right. but I, I hear you and I've actually thought deeply about this. I really believe that as soon as vaccine supply opens up a bit more and that we can add more appointments, the things that you are talking about are so easily doable from a tech perspective. It's just the practical constraints that we have now about the supply make them operationally highly problematic. Yeah, so, but it's just that people would feel better knowing they're registered instead of hitting a roadblock because, you know, that's what we experienced uh, when I tried, you know, the uh, health, health department uh, website to get a, a vaccine. That was like for four hours hitting my head against the wall. Uh, and I got cut. I got cut off so many times by, by going off on third parties and filling out form after form, only to find that there's nothing available or I'm not eligible. I love that one. I'm I'm over 65, and it just told me I wasn't available for the Moderna, without any explanation. So, I mean, your your site sounds your your new and improved site that you worked on the health department, uh, obviously to upgrade, is better. Uh, but I, I just think if we had people, if we can give them something tangible, whether that means that we, you're here, we, un, we know you're, you're waiting, and we'll try to notify you or locate uh, a vaccine. But aside from that, the, the mayor's office, um, let me ask a question more about this. The mayor's office of opportunity maintains a website called Access NYC. Uh, this helps folks uh, find, uh, you know, food, money, housing, work, and, and other city services. So it's access.nyc.gov. This tool is mobile friendly and has a, a code base that apparently would apply to finding vaccines. Um, are you aware of this, uh, Commissioner? Uh, I haven't recently been on that site, but most modern tools are mobile friendly, yes. But, but maybe we could look at that, uh, Dr. Shaksi, uh, maybe you could, could look at that because it might, might present some kind of a model that we could use to, to upgrade. I know uh, Commissioner Tish is on it. I have the utmost, uh, really, um, I know that she could, uh, I have faith in her that she could do it. Uh, no, no pun intended, but, uh, um, uh, but are we, you know, are we, tapping into the talent that we have out there. Uh, and so, I know initially we weren't. So let me describe to you what's gone on in the past five weeks or so. Um, clearly, the old site had real issues and New Yorkers needed and deserved better. No one is going to argue that point at all. I was brought in to fix it. And at Do It, we are not fixing it ourselves. We are working with some of the largest technology companies in the world on fixing it. 
Um, and there's multiple parts to this approach. So within the first two and a half weeks of coming in, we completely got rid of the old scheduling site that everyone really didn't like. And we replaced it like based on yours and the public's feedback with a brand new scheduling site, which is streamlined, which asks few, many fewer questions, only the very basics, um, which is knock on wood, stable and load tested. We have found that when appointments are available to be scheduled, it takes a person three to four minutes, soup to nuts, to schedule the appointment. They're able to schedule second dose appointment on that site. They're able to cancel, they're able to reschedule. I really believe that in you know, a period of two and a half weeks, we really stabilize that. But that is not enough for us, right? Because still today, New Yorkers have to go to way too many websites from way too many providers to figure out how to schedule an appointment only to find out that there are no doses and no appointments to be made. So what we have done is we have said to all providers citywide, this platform that we built for Dr. Chakchi and the health department, we want all providers in the city to use it. And we are offering it to all providers in the city as a service. We have recently gotten Capsule Pharmacy to leverage it, a site run by Northwell Health. Maimonides has agreed to use it at one of their mass vaccination sites, um, Hospital for Special Surgery. So this, this is like part of the vision here is not only build this new platform, make it easier to schedule, but then get all of the providers throughout the city on it. Do I have hope that we are going to get 100% of the providers on the system? No. I can bet you there is no chance that a company like Walgreens is ever going to use this platform. But can we make a real dent and get lots of providers to schedule appointments at lots of locations throughout the city through this platform? Absolutely. That is the goal. That is the vision. That is, frankly, my obsession over the next several weeks because I want to be in a place when, as vaccine supply expands, that there are fewer and fewer places for New Yorkers to have to go to desperately search for an appointment. Right. There will never be only one, right. but there can and should be fewer. And we have built with the collaboration of tech talent, frankly, from around the world, <laughs> uh, a platform to enable us to do that. All right. um, Chair Holden, if you'll if you'll allow me, I just wanted to um, add two points to Commissioner Tisch's um, you know excellent review. Uh, the first is to um, to underline what she said about the idea that this is not a, a sort of one and done um, process. We believe in continuous improvement. Um, yes, of course, of the technology, but doing it in a way where the technology and the operations um, are really linked together um, for us to be able to continually take in additional feedback um, and use that to, uh, to improve so that uh, today is better than yesterday and tomorrow will be better than today. So that was one point. And the second thing that I do wanna point out as well, um, which I know that you care about deeply is the link between uh, technology and equity uh, as well. And making sure that um, as we do make this as streamlined and simple as possible, that we also think about all of the ways in which um, we can uh, use and ensure technology to meet our equity imperative as well. And so that's something that we are also very actively thinking about when it comes to um, the, the next iterations of this work. Okay, I, I just want to go back. Uh, thank you, doctor. I just want to go back to um, Commissioner Tisch. Um, how are you um, measuring or taking in uh, the usability uh, feedback on uh, VAX for NYC? Um, and and uh, what, what type of user testing was done on it? 
you're you're muted. So we have to unmute you. Okay. Can we unmute the commissioner? All right. Good. Um, feedback. Um, I love getting feedback. I actually thrive on working based on bad feedback or a challenge or a problem that needs to be solved. So I will say in the race to replace the old scheduling system, most of that was driven by the feedback we got from all over the place about the old system. Too many questions too difficult to create an account and log in and two-factor authentication, can't schedule a second dose. Google Translate doesn't work well for, you know, in the medical context. We want to see, we don't want to answer too many questions before we see whether appointments are available. Like all of this, all of that feedback actively um, influenced, really shaped the fundamental desi design decisions that we've made, okay? That system was built in two and a half weeks. A week later, we expanded the system to be able to accommodate new providers that wanna come in. That's fast <laughs> as these systems go because it is so much more than a scheduling site. It's also the tech that all of the vaccinators and the flow monitors at all of the sites, at all the physical vaccination centers use to greet and treat and vaccinate patients. My point in telling you all of that is that was a heads down 24 hour a day process for three weeks. Now, what we want to do is go into a more formal and thoughtful process where we gain, where we get feedback on the existing platform now that it's like there, it's stable, it's serving New Yorkers, and in a thoughtful way, take in feedback specific to this platform, because I have no doubt that it can be um, improved. Um, as for testing, I think you also asked about user acceptance testing. Oh my God, did we test this thing? So. The single most important thing that you can do before you go live is test a system thoroughly. And so we did, oh, in the two and a half weeks of development that I said to build it, I would say about a week of it was just banging hard and testing the system and every permutation possible to find bugs but also to test load, right? Because you've seen in cities uh, across the country, in states across the country, all of these scheduling platforms are crashing. You know, we had it with like the, the state's uh, scheduling site crashed this weekend when, when they released all of their appointments. So we did, I would call it obscene levels of load testing. I mean, no guarantees, obviously, but like testing is key to going out of the gate with a bug free system. So, so you, you're confident it won't crash. Uh, you, you, I am confident. I mean, yeah, totally sorry, obviously, but. Here, Holden, we tested this system. We load tested it. We had the support of the CEO of Salesforce, Mark Benioff, who assigned Salesforce's lead engineer, Srini, to lead the load testing effort on this site. I am confident that we have done as much as we could possibly do to one, prepare for the very high load that we are anticipating and to be ready should we hit those loads to, to keep the site stable. Right, but load testing is different than usability, right? Um, yes, and that's why I talked about two pieces of testing, right? right? There yeah, was like- Did, the load did this before? Because I don't want to, I, I just don't want to, I just, I just want to get to one point. Um, who, who's involved? Who was, uh, 
you, you talked about tech talent. Who, who was involved in this, this effort that you uh, undertook for two and a half weeks? Oh, um, so the companies we work for, we work with is the platform is Salesforce. Um, and we have a Salesforce like integrator company that, that does like the customizations of it for us. And that company is a company called MTX. They're like a widely known Salesforce integrator. Um, honestly, I did most of the design work. <laughs> and the reason I did most of the design work <laughs> is it was based on the feedback that we've gotten and we wanted to get something out really quick. As I said, I am interested now that, that we've launched, we're stable, we're creating, we're making appointments to get a more formal feedback process in. As I said, I like taking feedback, um, but that's really how it was. This was like a mad dash to get this thing up, running, good, stable, and then we'll continue to improve from here. Great. All right. Uh, just a, a quick question for Dr. Shakshi. Uh, is, I'd like to, uh, Doctor, um, you, are you aware of the executive order from the governor that uh, people must get the vaccine in the same location, both vaccines? Yes, Chair Holden, I am aware of it. Uh, do you agree with that? Um, well, it is uh, part of the New York State guidance, as you know, that um, that we are subject to. Uh, the major benefit of it is um, simplicity from the perspective of, uh, you know, of the person getting vaccinated, so that they know, you know, at the appropriate interval, either three or four weeks after their first dose, um, they know to go back to the same place. So, I do think that has benefits. I will also observe there are. Uh, some exceptions that are permitted uh, to that, um, you know, in, in cases where, uh, you know, some, in uh, situations where someone has to go to a different um, site, uh, they have limitations themselves about where they can go, or in rare circumstances where, you know, a site itself may change. But, but that executive order might have cost nursing home patients their lives. Are you aware of that? Uh, Chair Holden, tell me tell me more about what you mean. We've we've had not only with my mom. Um, thankfully, my mom is still alive, but she got COVID because the nursing home withheld the vaccine in December to her and other patients that were rehab patients in the nursing home and weren't permanent uh, patients. They only vaccinated, and this is this wasn't only one nursing home. This was many nursing homes around the city didn't know how to schedule a second appointment for their rehab patients because they may not be in a nursing home. Like that mattered. This, the, the, fir the first thing is to get the vaccine in the people's arms, obviously, fast as you can to the most vulnerable population. Yet, the nursing homes were interpreting it that they can only, they can only give it to their permanent residents. And they left off a large population of rehab patients. Many of them died because a month later, weeks later, and that the state actually tried to cover up. And I thought, because we, we asked the state a number of times, is this an order? Well, they, the nursing home misinterpreted the order. Now I'd like to know, we, I think maybe your office can weigh into the governor's office about this and clear this up with the nursing homes because still people are being denied the vaccine who are rehab patients in nursing homes in New York City. I, I understand what you're saying. And uh, first, let me just say, I'm, I'm very sorry uh, for what you and your family went through. I imagine that was a painful and wrenching experience. And, um, and I appreciate uh, your sharing it because as you pointed out, you, know, you think it may be affecting uh, others as well um, based on, um, you know, on what's actually occurring in nursing homes. Uh, you know, I, I can't speak for New York State, as you know, you know, nor for specific nursing homes, um, but uh, I will be happy to have my office uh, look into this with respect to how it's being treated in the current day as yeah, well. It's got to be cleared up because people have died because they didn't get the vaccine, like I mentioned before, but 
if it's not clear, the governor's office should make it clear or exempt nursing homes because they have different patients. They have permanent patients, which they'll be in the same spot, you know, 20, 27 days or whatever it is, 28 days between vaccines. Um, and then a lot of them won't be. So we all get cards. I mean, I got vaccinated, I got a card and I could bring it anywhere and, and get the second Moderna if one is not available at the, my um, initial location. So I think this needs to be investigated and I hope the city council looks at this because this, I know a lot of people that, that lost their parents because of this, uh, this so-called executive order or policy that wasn't clear to nursing homes. But um, thank you, Doug. I, I don't want to go on because uh, I, the, a lot of my colleagues have questions. I do have a lot of a lot more questions, but uh, I'll 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 go back to uh, uh, Chair Levine for uh, further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Holden. And actually, I'm going to pass it to Committee Council Ahuja for our colleagues to ask their questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm now going to be calling on council members in the order in which they have used the Zoom raise hand function. As a reminder, council members, if you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The sergeant at arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. And you should begin once I have called on you and the sergeant ha has announced that you may begin. For questions, we will hear first from Council Member Ambry Samuel, followed by Council Member Deutsch, followed by Council Member Rodriguez, followed by Council Member Ku. Council Member Ambry Samuel, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Chairs, for the opportunity. Um, first, I want to say, Dr. Chowski, I'm wishing you continued strength and good health, um, and I'm glad to see you here. And Commissioner Cortez Vasquez, of course, I'm always, always, always glad to see you. Um, I do appreciate the efforts made finally to reach the homebound seniors and to get home health aides vaccinated in my district and the announcement of the teacher's prep site. Um, we are definitely moving forward, and I appreciate that. Um, and I also want to just give a shout out to Dr. Easterling, who has been a beacon of light and hope um, for so many in our district. And I appreciate the ongoing communication and notices that he provides us. Um, I just want to co-sign everything that was stated by Chair Chen um, regarding all of our seniors, um, but not just the NYCHA seniors, but also the seniors that live in HUD 202 buildings. Um, Commissioner Cortez Vasquez, you mentioned having a list of senior sites um, I would also like to just kind of get a sense of the list of the CBOs that you are working with at these senior sites and not the ones that are, um, you know, contracted through DIFTA to work in the NYCHA sites, but the ones that are within the 202 buildings. Um, we've had conversations in the past, like during the testing um, related to the, the HUD 202 buildings, because I have so many of them and a lot of them are not at all um, formal senior centers and they don't have churches that work with them. And so I would just like to get a sense of what is the actual plan? And I know you spoke about it briefly with Margaret Chen, but what's like, just give an example of um, what the city is planning around the vaccines that will be coming in, but specifically for the residents in the 202 buildings that don't have a formal CBO working with them. Thank you. First of, first of all, it's great to see you also. Um, and in addition to the 249 CBOs that dip the contract with directly, we've also included in the 75 plus task force, you know, older adult task force that gives us day to day feedback. We've also included um, some faith leaders and uh, we've also included all of the what I call the ethnic federations, Hispanic Federation, Asian American Federation, Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies and the uh, Black Charities. So that we could also see what networks they have and how do we incorporate one, get feedback from them, you know, real time feedback. And then the other is to ensure that as we are rolling out this plan and expanding it, 
that we are not um, excluding any of those groups that are not as part of uh, DIFTA's uh, aging network. All right, so it's it's two things. It's, it's automatic feedback, but also inclusion um, because like you and, and, and Dr. Trotsky said so well before, equity and that equity lens is a lot of what's driving most of this because those are the most vulnerable populations. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. And one last question, um, just, just about the specific numbers. Um, you may have said it already, I'm not sure, um, but how many seniors who live in NYCHA have already been vaccinated? And how I, many are, are, you know, are we still reaching out to? I, I heard the 1.3 number for the, the overall seniors, but I'm just trying to figure out if we have an exact number for the number of NYCHA seniors, the number of seniors that actually live in NYCHA and the number that have already been vaccinated. I can get, um, NYCHA is not here, but I will make sure that you get that number. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Trotsky to see if he has any numbers on the older adults that have been vaccinated to date. Uh, but I will get you the number that live in um, NYCHA facilities and uh, the number that, and how they've been, uh, the number that have been reached out and, um, uh, already contacted. All right. So, and the reason why I asked that question is sure. is just because um, we have been doing a number of of outreach efforts, and and you already know we did rehouses in my district. We did Van Dyke. We were working with Glimmer, yeah. and so um, I just wanted to get a sense of how many, just so we can know the the push that we have to continue doing moving forward. Yeah, we'll we don't have that right now for you, but I like I made a commitment to uh, to to. To uh, Chairwoman Chin, I will get you that number, and I will also get the list of all of the sites across <laughs> the city that are dedicated to older adults. The, the one part, the one part that I am able to answer, Council Member, is that. Um, uh, well, first, let me just say we we very much share that aim, and as you have seen, that has been a focus of ours. Um, it's the intersection of our equity goal and our goal to reach older New Yorkers. Um, and to meet people where they are. Uh, and so thus far, um, we've vaccinated over 5,000 uh, older New Yorkers who are in um, NYCHA buildings. Uh, and that is of course, only the start of, uh, of what we will continue to do. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Next, we will hear from Council Member Deutsch, followed by Council Member Rodriguez, Council Member Ku, and then Council Member Barron. As a reminder to panelists, if you could stay unmuted during the question and answer period, that would be greatly appreciated. Council Member Deutsch, you may begin when you are. Thanks, Dr. Thank Mayor. you. Thank you. Um, so my question is to Dr. Uh, Chasky. Um, who makes the decision of what sites uh, become available throughout the city? And is there a metric to it of how decisions are made? Um, thank you, Council Member, for the question. Um, the decisions about uh, city sites, which is, I believe, what you're asking about, um, those are made through the Vaccine Command Center, um, where uh, we look at a host of different factors, but particularly um, where uh, we know um, there is a need for greater access to vaccination. Um, where we know uh, we have, you know, a particular equity goal to meet, um, you know, particularly with places that have been hardest hit during the pandemic, uh, and where we can serve a sufficient number of people. So are you familiar with zip code 11235? Uh, please tell me a little bit more about it. Which neighborhood does that represent? So that's uh, Sheepshead Bay in Manhattan Beach area. Yes. Okay, so how many vaccine sites do I have in those areas in the southern part of uh, Brooklyn? Uh, Council member, I don't uh, know that off of the top of my head. If we so go to- So my, qu my question is, um, I have been sending emails to the Department of Health and to other city agencies and no response. And I've been asking to expand the vaccine uh, vaccine locations as well as vaccines because I have a very high uh, senior population and as well as a high COVID rate. 
uh, rate. And um, I'd like to know um, how many vaccines actually come into my district, how many people actually receive it. And I just want to say, I, I would question my colleagues, but I just want to tell you that in my office, I have um, two or three staff members who work full time to try to get appointments and they cannot get appointments. So it's a, it's a waste of resources to have in each council list. So I guarantee you that every single council member um, has dedicated staff members who are wasting their time and resources every single day trying to make appointments for their constituents. And what I would say is that you should use those resources instead of having them wasted um, on making endless appointments where they can't even get an appointment and using our council offices and giving us uh, an amount of vaccines that are coming in that at least if um, we, 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 we could schedule, we could have a waiting list. We could make our own waiting list because I don't think any person, any senior should have to call more than once and not get an appointment and then call again and then again and again and again call our office back and forth and it's just endless. So I have no problem. I could speak for myself that I could make my own waiting list and call back the constituents when those vaccines become available to tell them, okay, we could get an appointment now, but without having the proper information from the agencies to tell us how many vaccines are coming in, then we're left in the dark and we're left in the, we, then we're left in the, in the dark. And I think it's very unfair when the when we are held accountable for our constituents to make sure they get the vaccines, or at least they should know that there is um, a waiting list that we could call them back when those vaccines are av available. But without the office letting us know of how many vaccines are coming in, then we don't know that we don't have that information. There is there is zero communication between, I could say, for my office and Department of Health. And that's totally unacceptable. And I'm willing to I'm willing to work with the Department of Health. And as you know, I have one of the highest COVID rates in the city of New York. I have not heard from Governor Cuomo once since March. I have not heard from the mayor since March, since the beginning of the pandemic, about the high COVID rate. And there's little communication. So to me, it seems like the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And um, this needs to be resolved and we need to have more accountability uh, for these vaccines and for our constituents. Uh, well, thank you, council member. I, I certainly understand your points and um, I can assure you that uh, I'm committed uh, to ensuring that um, my team is coordinating uh, with your staff uh, on, you know, the information um, that, uh, that you're requesting. Um, and we do have uh, quite a bit of coordination right. across city government um, through the Vaccine Command Center, as I had mentioned. Two things that I will mention uh, that, um, you know, perhaps you uh, or your constituents um, may benefit from are uh, the fact that, you know, the access points that do exist are uh, very easily searchable at nyc.gov slash vaccine finder. Um, and as Commissioner Tish has mentioned, we'll continue to add additional information to that uh, site to make it a one-stop shop, you know, for people who are looking for points of access um, that are close to them. And then the second part is we are um, sharing uh, quite a bit of detailed information about vaccination at the zip code level. Um, and all of that uh, is also available, um, you know, via our website. Uh, you can get to it um, from nyc.gov slash COVID vaccine. So are you going to have, um, am I, is someone going to reach out um, to my office? Someone going to reach out to me from your office? Are you assuring me that we're going to have better communication um, because what says in the website, what actually happens to different things. And also you keep on expanding the eligibility for vaccines when you're saying there's no vaccines available. So we need to take care of one at a time. We need to take care of those seniors first and the people who have underlying issues and the people that are homebound. So we keep on expanding and expanding and expanding with almost no vaccines available. So we're getting everyone to go on a portal. We're getting everyone to, to, to call the elected officials complaining. 
but if there's no vaccines, why are we expanding it? Let's do one thing at a time. Let's get the job done. And I think there has to be more, um, uh, more communication with those elected officials uh, throughout the city. And, you know, we're in a crisis. Do you agree we're in a, we're in a crisis right now? So if we're in a crisis, I'm sure you agree. Um, but if we're in a crisis and I don't receive a call from anyone from your office, from DOH, from the mayor, or even the governor, okay? And I have one of the highest COVID rates in the city of New York. And since March, since March, the mayor has not called me once you have not called me once and that's unacceptable because if we need to take care of those areas that have a high COVID rate i should be getting phone calls from your office every single day how can we stop this what can we do how can we help um well again thank you council member and and um yes actually we have been in touch and uh but i'll make sure that uh you know you, you have, have the been communication in touch. you have been in touch with who um well you and i have been in touch directly council member but i take your point which is that you would uh, like even deeper communication which uh, is something that we're very committed to doing um certainly I, I with have, you i, have, I uh, have not seen it i have not seen it and i hope from now, from today, from this hearing, that there'll be a lot more yes. communication. Allow me to articulate it because that's a shared goal um, because we know that this vaccination campaign uh, will be most successful um, through partnership with all of you. I did wanna just point out one other thing, which is, um, you know, as you're aware, the eligibility is determined by New York State. And you're right that the eligibility has broadened you know, quite a bit uh, over the last several weeks, which is a good thing on the one hand, because it means more and more um, New York City residents are able to get vaccinated, um, but we do remain in a period where there is very limited supply. And so as a city, what we're committed to doing is to, while we're in this place where we have many people who are eligible, and limited supply is to work with all of you to ensure that the people who will most benefit from vaccination um, with respect to saving lives and preventing suffering um, is uh, whom we reach out to uh, and try to connect up with vaccination. So I, I welcome uh, additional collaboration with you toward that end. Okay, and it's very easy for the city to come into my district to close up stores for months at a time but not giving us uh, the vaccines that are needed in an area that has a high COVID rate, one of the highest in the city of New York, if not the highest. But closing up the establishments, closing up the stores, closing up the synagogues, closing up the churches, closing up the mosques, that is fine. But when it comes to making sure that this, um, this uh, um, virus is not spread by giving us the most needed vaccines in a district, that has a very high COVID rate is unacceptable. So I appreciate um, what you're telling me now, and I'm looking forward to really, um, you know, getting these vaccines out and having more communication with your office. Thank you, council member. I welcome it as well. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Next, we'll be, we'll be turning to council member Rodriguez for questions. You may begin when you are ready. I start now. Comisionado, yo creo que la ciudad de Nueva York le debe de pedir perdón a la comunidad de latinas, afroamericana y asiática por la ciudad y el estado haberle fallado en este momento. Creemos de que de esta comunidad no hay duda que donde murieron las mayores personas simplemente por tener más precondiciones de salud que lo puso a ellos target más fuerte para morir por, eh, 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 condiciones de salud producto de una sociedad que no ha invertido en los lugares más pobres en crear buenos empleos en invertir en salud de calidad y producto de eso murieron la mayoría de las personas pero hoy también tenemos una ciudad que la zona postal demuestran y nos dan vergüenza de que en los lugares más pobres 
donde murieron más personas, donde tuvieron más el COVID, es donde menos se han vacunado. Simplemente porque nosotros como ciudad seguimos viviendo en la ciudad que como nuestro amigo alcalde Billy Blasio fue electo por un mandate de la ciudad de cerrar la brecha entre el rico y el pobre, todavía lo tenemos hoy. I want to ask, you know, a few questions. I want to, you know, go straight because of my time. Do we agree that most people who died and who got the COVID so far in the city of New York live in the seacode where most of them are black, Latino, and Asian? And I just want to say yes or no. Uh, yes, if you'll allow me to say a bit more, um, yes, and that is I just prefer with a yes or no because I want to elaborate some question that I would I'll be like very to brief. I'll be very brief, council member, to say yes, and uh, that is why we have oriented our... Okay. I, I want to stay there. I don't want to end that part. So the second part is, and, and of course, I want to ask you the question when I hope that you also you elaborate. And the second question is, do we also agree that even though most people who die and most people who got the COVID are black, Latino, and Asian, the poorest New Yorkers, the breakdown today show that most people who got the vaccine live in the sea code who are not black, Asian, and Latino. Is that accurate? The data shows that we have more work to do in that respect, no, yes. Is that accurate that most people, that they, the sea code that we have today around Central Park in the West Side are not necessarily the sea code where most people die because in the other hand, the sea code that we don't do agree who got most COVID, while more people die, when we look at the data, have less percentage of people that got the vaccine. Is that accurate? Uh, well, it is more nuanced than that. When you look at uh, the specific zip codes, there are differences. But uh, what I think we share is uh, the uh, idea Commissioner, that- Commissioner, I don't want to get into the- I don't want into the share. I want Brown to get- sorry, I'm sorry, Commissioner. I just want to get into, first of all, with those numbers, to, to compare where we are today. Because if, if we don't deal with the reality, then we do business as usual. And I know that that's not what you have in your heart. I know no. that you want to close the gap. And I know that today we need to recognize that the society should apologize. Are you ready to apologize in the name of the city of New York? Not because you as an individual fail, but yet because as a city and the state and the federal government, those who put policy together, fail on creating the condition that even though most people that are the black, Asian, and Latino, those community has not been targeted so far to get the vaccine. Do you think that we should apologize to those communities? Well, council member, as a, as a doctor and a public servant, um, what I want to do is to keep working as hard as I possibly can. Question, simple question. Do you think that we should apologize? To rectify these issues. Do you think that we should apologize? As, as I said, sir, uh, my commitment is to work to I know, change. I'm not asking you for you on the plan of moving forward, Commissioner. I have a question about moving forward. I'm asking about us today. Do you think that we should apologize? I think we should work to make things better. It's one more time where a commissioner can, is speaking on behalf of the city of New York, and not be able to address to say, we should apologize. Those communities have people who care for them. It is unfair. It is unacceptable, commissioner. It's I, about I race. It's about social class. Tragedy. It's about the black, Asian, and Latino not having a seat on the table. It's Mr. Mayor, Angelo Facon had right when he said 10,000 leadership positions in the city of New York and no branch of government as today have the reflection of leadership sitting in those tables, making those decisions. How did it happen? How did it happen in our, in our watch? Is there a phone number today where people can call to make an appointment to get the vaccine? Not those people, because those people, they are the majority. 
29% of the city they're Latino, 27% they're black, 57% they're Asian. Most of those individuals who pay their taxes, it's not about only to connect them with the senior center, it's also about addressing the reality that they should be able to get their appointment by phone. Is there a phone number today where people can make that appointment? Yes, there is a phone number. Can you That's share it. with all the phone number? Which is the phone number that people should call today not to be connected, but yes, to make that appointment to get the vaccine? Yes, the phone number is 877-VAX4NYC. Thank you, Commissioner. And this is not toward you. This is about the frustration that I know that vast majority have, unfortunately, in no branch of government. We, the poorest neighborhood, have been seeing that we have been a top priority. And that's why we are here today. So moving forward, I trust you. I believe in the mayor. I believe that he's progressing. I defend the mayor, but as a society, we have failed to black, to Asian in community, and unless we don't take, take the necessary step, we will continue just moving forward, but we fail as, as today. Thank you, council member. Thank you, council member. We'll now be moving to council member Ku for questions, followed by council member Barron. Council member Ku, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you, thank, thank you, doctor and um, and other commissioners. Uh, I want to thank Council Member Rodriguez for mentioning that Asians as part of the community, a uh, minority, because a lot of times city administration they only talk about black and brown, and I always feel like we are the forgotten uh, nephews and cousins of the minority group. So I want to thank uh, Council Member Rodriguez to mention uh, Asian Americans as part of the uh, minority population in New York City, um, because the city hasn't done that. So my question to you, doctor, is I'm, I'm reading today's uh, uh, local Chinese paper, the World Journal, they have a front page uh, local news is that positivity rate in Flushing is the second highest for the last seven days, 13.37 uh, percent in the 11355 area. And you know, Fushing is a very congested and very densely populated area in the New York City. And, and the last seven days, at the, the previous seven days, I think we had the highest, uh, we had the highest positivity rates. Yet, only 3% of the po local population here received second doses of vaccination. And 7% uh, received the first dose. So you can tell by the numbers that the city is not doing a good job in vaccinating uh, uh, the, the senior citizens and the local population of this area, even though we have the highest positive rate. And among the population sites, even though the city recently opened city field, but when you call, it's always hard to get an appointment. So a lot of local doctors com uh, complain to us, why don't we just give it to the family doctors? Just need a full shot. They can administer in their office and the patients uh, uh, like to go to their doctors because they feel safe there instead of going to the uh, city field, which is really far away for them. Um, so that's one question. And the second question I want to pose is, one of the reasons why positivity rate, positivity rate of COVID-19 is so high in fashion is because our sidewalks are so congested. It's like occupied sidewalks by all the unlicensed and licensed vendors here. No, it's like open market. Uh, there's a free market every day. No, you walk on the sidewalks on fashion, and it's really hard to walk. It, like, there's no social distancing. Uh, it's really hard to keep safe in the local area, local pedestrians. Well, 
And I have been complaining about this for the, uh, to the mayor and to the city administration for six, seven months. Nothing has done. The local population is frustrated. How can Department of Health doesn't enforce the social distance rule uh, in the sidewalks? I haven't heard anything from the commissioner. Can you answer to that? I know it's not part of it. It's not your job to enforce, man. But there are a lot of people selling sausages, fish, you no, know, all kinds of things on the sidewalks. No, it's crazy. And, and the people are frustrated by the administration for their impotence and not doing anything. The police not doing anything. The consumer face not doing anything. The deal, Department of Transportation, Department of Trans, Transportation is not doing anything. The sanitation department is not doing anything. There's no one doing anything. Even though in the name of COVID, they stopped doing things. Only the traffic agency, I see them, they are really busy giving out tickets. It's the only agency they're working. So I want you, uh, Commissioner, uh, Dr. Uh, Choshi, to, uh, to answer, how can you help the downtown fashion to alleviate the congestion problem in the sidewalks? Uh, well, thank you, Council Member Ku. You covered quite a bit of ground there. Um, let me try to uh, respond briefly. Um, first, I, I just want to say I, I share your concern. You know, the positivity rate uh, in flushing is um, much higher than where we need it to be, and so it is something that we have to um, to look at uh, and um, ensure uh, access to vaccination which uh, as you know, is very limited by the supply right now, but which we do have to continue to make strides on. Um, but also to get to the other things that we've mentioned uh, that can help curb the spread of COVID-19, uh, including uh, mask wearing, and as you've pointed out, you know, the ability to- uh, Time has to expired. So, um, you know, the, with respect to the ahead, sidewalks- yeah. and Finish it, yeah. I, yes, I, I am- uh, I'm not intimately familiar with, um, you know, the issues that you're raising. They are things that we can- I can show you a picture if you can see, right? The newspaper printed a picture of the congestion of the sidewalks here, you know? Mm -hmm. you know there's, mm -hmm. On both sides of the sidewalks are occupied by vendors, but mostly unlicensed. They're selling all kinds of things. So you have to like squeeze you in between, especially in some streets. They're so congested, but I don't understand why City is not doing anything. This is not a third world country. We have 40,000 police. We have like so many sanitation workers. And all we need is to talk to the mayor, do something, you no? Know? Otherwise the people are yes. frustrated. You know? They say, what the city fucking? They're not, not doing anything. Well, well, what I can say is that- so, uh, There's no use to understand. We, we need actions. We need results. We need outcomes, right? That's why there's, COVID-19 is so high in downtown area here because it's so congested. It's like every day is New Year's Eve, the Times Square, you know? So can you talk to the administration, do something? Yes. Uh, otherwise, I've, I've why heard, would we pay tax? I have heard you, Council Member Ku, and it is something that uh, we can raise among our colleagues. Especially the Department of Health, you can look, stop those things, people selling sausages and fish on the streets, you know? So there's no, no, no solution. It depends on the permits that uh, they have, but that is something that we can look into. They are un unlicensed, they have no permits. They have no permits. Thank you, Council Member. All right, I, said, I guess the city has no solutions, no? No, yeah, thank you. Thank you for raising the issue, Council Member. We'll be we'll be happy to look into it, as I mentioned. Thank you, Member. Thank you, Council Member Cool. I'll now be turning to Council Member Barron for questions. You may begin. Time starts now. Uh, thank you so much. I want to thank uh, the chairs for this important hearing about the situation that we're facing now across the world, situation of this virus that's ravaging the country and killing 
millions. Commissioner, thank you for being here and for your team to respond to our questions. Uh, I don't, I'm sure that you're aware that the zip code that is in my district, 11239, had the highest mortality rate in all of New York State. And that 11239, in fact, is encompassing all of Starrett City and a few adjoining blocks. And a part of those blocks are in that 11239, there are at least uh, two nursing homes that we know of. Do you have any information as to what impact those nursing homes may have had on the numbers that led to the highest mortality rate in the city? Um, well, thank you, Council Member Barron, for the question. Uh, as you know, um, nursing homes and the um, data related to nursing homes are regulated by the state. But to your question more specifically, um, you know, we have looked uh, specifically at the, the tragic uh, numbers in the 11239 zip code. Uh, and what I can um, say, although we will look into it in detail, uh, is that it was a more generalized phenomenon, you know, with respect to the mortality rate uh, in that zip code um, than something that would be explained by just one or two nursing homes. So unfortunately, I think it was a, um, a, a broader uh, phenomenon that contributed to the suffering that we saw there. Well, okay, uh, I would be pleased to know the results as they come to your attention. And to also note that there is a NYCHA senior housing development also in that 11239 zip code. Now we know that historically, uh, people of color, blacks in particular, have been subjected to all kinds of inequities and prejudices and racist policies. And we're very familiar with the fact that the Tuskegee Institute in fact had black men engaged in an experiment to see what the effects would be on people who had syphilis and who did not receive the treatments that were available. And we know that during the South also there were many forced sterilizations and many opportunities where women were subjected to procedures that were unnecessary. And we also know that uh, uh, the Dr. Sims horrors were perpetrated on enslaved women that he used specifically for his development of his gynecological procedures. And we've been fighting and we were successful to have that statue removed because we don't think we should pay homage to those who had such a horrific history of uh, abuse. So we know now that during the, uh, a year ago, well, back in April, May, June, that this pandemic had a higher impact on black and brown communities, yet the ship from the governor and the field hospital and the uh, the adjustment of, of the Javits Center to providing medical facilities were all centered in the white community, which did not demonstrate the occurrence or the numbers to warrant what the governor did. You would think that people who have, uh, that those agencies and those responsible for responding to this crisis would in fact have made preparations once the vaccine was available to make sure that the black communities with all of their, I figure what you call hesitancy and reluctance, whatever the terms are that you're throwing around based on, based on historical records of black people in particular, having been abused, mistreated and used experimentally. You would think that the agencies would have sat down at the beginning and said, okay, we know where the greatest occurrence was Let's target those areas first, because we can justify bringing that here. What was the procedure, what was the mechanism or the protocols that you used in establishing what would be permanent or regular uh, sites where the vaccines would be distributed? Um, well, thank you for asking such an important question. And um, you are absolutely right to point out 
uh, all of the ways in which um, the devastating history of structural racism in our country uh, unfortunately reverberate um, still today. Uh, they are not just um, things that we read about in the history books, they are things that are affecting uh, New Yorkers uh, and uh, our families, our neighbors um, at this very moment. Uh, and yes, uh, these are things that unfortunately we have all borne witness to over the last year during the COVID-19 pandemic and therefore um, have been a, a very um, deep part of our planning with respect to the vaccination campaign. Um, at the health department, I can say that, you know, our core values are science, equity, and compassion. And so we have uh, uh, folded in uh, the idea that equity has to be central to how we think about success um, with respect to vaccination. It's something that um, our chief equity officer, Dr. Torian Easterling, has uh, really spearheaded um, with respect and to our And he's done effort. a great job in the town halls that he's conducted in East New York. He's done two uh, that we've helped sponsor. He's done a great job in that regard, Dr. Easley and Thank also you. Dr. Scott, who accompanied him. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you. And we're going to be doing much, much, much more of that. Um, but to get to your specific question, you know, with respect to um, how we're actually doing this, um, you know, I mentioned allocation, access, and outreach as three of the pillars of how we're actually going to turn equity into action. Um, and specifically uh, with respect to access, you know, you're asking how were the locations selected uh, for city sites? And much of that has flowed from uh, our focus on um, the neighborhoods identified by the task force uh, for racial inclusion and equity, where we look at um, data, not just from the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but also the deeper seated historical injustices that we've talked about to figure out where we need to ensure that there is greater access to try to redress um, the inequities that we know exist. Well, let me just uh, offer two specifics and then I'll pass on to my other colleagues that may have questions. Uh, the Starrett owners, the owners of Starrett City Spring Creek Towers have offered their location as a vaccination site. They already have a, a testing site and they have offered their location as a vaccination site. I have supported them in that request. I've sent a letter to both the le uh, to the mayor and the governor and haven't got a positive response yet. But I would say that that would be something very specific that you can say, wow, this was the highest mortality rate. And now we wanna make sure that we have the convenience for the persons who are living here to get vaccinated if they so choose. And secondly, uh, it was announced, I believe yesterday, that there would be a vaccination site at the teacher's preparatory high school, uh, and it would be designed particularly for Brownsville and East New York. And I understand that that grand opening fell flat on its face. I can't understand how you can make an announcement that you're having a grand opening at from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., people are lined up at eight o'clock and there are no signs, there's no signage, there's no personnel, there's no instruction, oh, we're not opening to 10. That does not build confidence in a community that already is questioning whether they should take the vaccine. Um, well, first, thank you for, for passing along, uh, you know, that potential site. Um, and you, thank you for thinking of that. That's exactly the type of partnership uh, that we need. So I appreciate it. Um, I do know, you know, within the Vaccine Command Center, uh, we are vetting potential sites um, literally uh, each day um, to figure out where our next wave of access points um, can and should be. Uh, as we've spoken about, um, you know, unfortunately, because of the very limited supply that we have right now, we're not able to, um, to get to as many of those places as we would like at this moment. But it's still very valuable for us because it gives us uh, a list um, that we can use to expand out um, access once supply does begin to pick up. Um, and uh, with respect to teachers prep, um, you know, thank you for the feedback. Uh, I do know that um, the plan is to ramp up there. Um, you know, as with many other places, there's a, uh, a relatively um, small number of vaccines that are currently um, available for any, you know, site across the city. 
um, but it is it was important uh, to us and particularly um, you know to to the mayor to ensure that we had an access point um, in that neighborhood. And so we will look to build upon that in the coming days and weeks. Thank you to you and to your team. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To both Thank you, to Council Member Barron. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Barron. Next, uh, we have Council Member Levin for question. You may and, and Council Member Levin, just, just very quick, uh, I, I understand that the commissioner who's uh, still recovering from COVID and now going three hours, I don't want to keep him too much longer. So uh, if you can just try and keep to five minutes, Steve, we'd appreciate it. You got it. For sure. Yep. Um, hi, Commissioner. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. I'm glad you're I'm glad you're 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 feeling better and on the mend. Um, and I want to thank you, obviously, for uh, all that you and your team have been doing um, over the last month and a half. This is a, a Herculean effort. Um, you know, and, and, and the biggest mobilization of resources that, you know, our city has seen in, in um, generations. And so we greatly appreciate um, everything you're doing day in and day out. Um, I asked you back in, uh, in December um, of a hypothetical um, uh, uh, case um, where a senior citizen lives in NYCHA. Um, she has limited English proficiency, no family nearby to help her. Um, uh, her senior center is closed um, and she doesn't have any proficiency in technology whatsoever. Um, how is she going to get her vaccination? Yes, uh, thanks for asking the question. And I remember, um, you know, you're uh, raising this specific case. I appreciated it because it makes me think of, uh, of the patients that I've taken care of and exactly how we have to reach out to people who may not use the internet, you know, very often may not be glued to the television. Um, and so for whom we need to have other channels, you know, to reach out to them. Um, we have uh, built many of those channels, uh, you know, since we spoke about it back in December. Uh, we have the, um, the hotline that's available for someone to uh, speak to uh, a city representative, you know, in their language of choice that will help them navigate uh, the scheduling process. Um, because so, you mentioned- so, But it'll help them navigate it. That will, it, will it get them an appointment? Say this person does not have a computer no computer access whatsoever. They can get an yes, appointment through the, them, through the hotline? Yes, absolutely. If appointments are available, it will get them an appointment. We will be able to convey it to them you know, over the phone so that they know precisely when and where to show up, um, what to bring with them, uh, you know, and again, all of that in the person's uh, native language. Um, so that's one avenue. Uh, I you know, have to mention, since um, you're using the example of a NYCHA resident, that this is a particular focus of ours with respect to outreach as well. Um, you know, not just uh, bringing uh, uh, vaccination clinics into NYCHA developments, um, but really working with our partners um, at NYCHA uh, to uh, reach out, to do door-to-door -door canvassing, you know, to do phone calls, um, to work through the channels that, uh, that we already know um, are established to be able to um, communicate with NYCHA residents. Um, but that's not in every NYCHA development. So there's not a, I mean, are, are you are you doing door-to-door -door canvassing in every NYCHA development or is NYCHA, who's who's doing the, the canvassing? Um, we do it as a partnership. Uh, you know, the Vaccine Command Center is, um, is the group that organizes it across agencies. Um, the initial focus, as we've talked about a little bit um, mm -hmm. prior in the hearing, is on NYCHA developments that have, um, you know, a concentration of older New Yorkers, um, because it is so important to get our seniors vaccinated sooner. Mm -hmm. um, are you seeing the disparity between certain communities having higher rates right now? And a community, whiter and richer communities um, having higher uh, vaccination rates in the city right now, and and uh, communities of color having lower rates. Are you seeing that as a a crisis? How are you how are you approaching it right now in terms of the 
the disparity itself? Is that a, is that a, how are you, are you, are you, are you seeing it as a crisis? I guess would be the question. Um, well, yes, you know, it, it is a, uh, it is a crisis within a crisis. Um, we know that, uh, you know, inequity has manifested in many different ways during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we have to uh, try to redress that as much as possible through um, what we're doing with vaccination. And as we've spoken about, uh, you know, the data indicates that we have much more to do in that respect uh, to be able to um, to make sure that vaccination is getting to the people who will most benefit from it. All right. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I'm glad that uh, you're joining us today, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're feeling better. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Council Member 11. Um, I don't see any other hands for Council Member questions, so I'm going to turn it back to the chairs. To All right. I, I just, I just want to thank uh, you, Commissioner Dr. Chakshi, uh, Commissioner Cortez Vasquez, uh, Commissioner Tish, for your testimony, and uh, especially you, Doctor, for um, toughing it out when you're still recovering from COVID. So uh, we appreciate that and um, wish you uh, a full and speedy recovery. Thank I you. I really appreciate it. Thank you all for your leadership. Thank you. Um, and we're now going to, uh, I'll, I'll turn it back to Committee Council Ahuja, but I believe our first. Uh, our next panel is uh, our wonderful borough president, uh, Gail Brewer. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to thank the administration for their testimony. We have now concluded administration testimony and we'll be turning to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. After I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. There may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted and we thank you in advance for your patience. Please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use a Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you after the panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you have raised your hands. I would like to now welcome our first panel. Um, and our first panelist will be the Honorable Gail A. Gail A. Brewer. You may begin when you are ready. Thank you very much, all chairs. This is a fabulous hearing. I have been listening. I want to say a few things. First of all, as uh, Chair Mark Levine knows, we have a vaccine, vaccine task force, which we started about a month ago. We've been meeting every Tuesday at three o'clock, and we've learned a lot. It's uh, one hour. It's not a gripe session, it's a sharing session. And I think it has made a difference in terms of people feeling that they have information. And I feel bad because I know we don't want to just harp on the agencies, but it is the kind of thing that the agency should have done in my opinion from the very beginning, because then we would have avoided some of these issues. So on the technology, and again, this has come up a lot. Um, obviously what we would like would be one portal. As elected officials, we talk to the state, we talk to the city. We talked to the Veterans Administration, we talked to CDC, and then we talked to the hospitals, and then we talked to the pharmacies, and then we talked to the federally qualified health centers, just to give you an, an idea of what it's been like. So it, transparency is really important. Um, what we have even is we talk to hot tips from WhatsApp. Those groups are often able, believe it or not, people hear about stuff on next door. It's a very multi-layered challenge to get an appointment. And I know that we've heard about it a lot. Um, it's also the issue of the Wi-Fi, which of course is a student concern and something that we've all been bringing. So um, I wanna thank uh, Do It and Commissioner Tish. Um, you know, I believe there are still quite a few, um, even though there's one good one, there are quite a few sites there and people will continue to do the informal site, just to say reality here. So one portal, one call center. I might be talking to the wind, but I would like to see that for our constituents. Number two, we all know um, about the zip code issue. We know who's been hurt the most. And I just want to mention as an example, something to bring into it is the New York Academy of Medicine, which has been at every one of our task forces with an amazing map listing all the senior locations where seniors live, the languages they speak, where there are opportunities for getting a vaccination and they're gonna layer it with the inequities. 
this kind of information needs to get out there. It needs to be shared. It needs to be go to every single neighborhood. And yet I have a feeling it's still kind of not something that the city wants to partner with. Um, I also want to mention and reiterate what others have said. The senior centers are the place to be. I heard really clearly about Hamilton Madison. And certainly we know that in that same time period when they were doing a great job on the Lower East Side at Thurgood Marshall, which is an uptown location, um, somebody forgot to tell the residents, I guess it was NYCHA, that there were 130 shots available. And we ran around like chickens that Sunday trying to get 130 people to show up in an hour's notice. So, you know, those kinds of things don't show that there is um, support for this program for those who need it the most. And that's what I think we're all trying to say today. But pop-ups are good, but they have to have some kind of pre-information. And um, I'm glad it went well downtown, a great, great, great nonprofit. Every single development of a pop-up should have a nonprofit that goes with it. When C. Virginia Fields was working in Harlem with Wadley, Every single 162 shots got taken by the people from the community. And that's what needs to happen. I want to mention Roosevelt Island because they don't have a vaccination site. There are tons of seniors who live there, lots of capacity for making them um, able to use whatever is available. I know I see here the wonderful folks um, who are from the nonprofit community working with adults, certainly everybody like Meals on Wheels vaccinating homebound seniors has to start planning now, even though we may not have the supply. And we will hear, I'm sure from Meals on Wheels, they have trucks, guess what they have? A refrigerator. So that could be an example of how to put on wheels the vaccination. Meals are done by three o'clock. Three, start doing vaccinations. Not complicated, but you have to start now. Um, I know that there are 20,000 eligible seniors, just as an example, working with that one nonprofit. Um, so I'm here to say that, you know, uh, other uh, cities have already started doing, even before Johnson & Johnson, doing that kind of work. And we need to make sure that it is copied and replicated and done even better. Thank you very much to this hearing. Um, and I look forward to continuing to work with you every Tuesday, three o'clock. You're welcome to join us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam President. I'm going to turn it to the chairs for any questions. Uh, so well, br very briefly, uh, Borough President Brewer, uh, thank you so much for standing up for seniors throughout this entire crisis and doing it again with vaccination. And you're right. Actually, the state of Vermont is now doing home-based vaccination with the Moderna vaccine. Yep. They didn't wait until Johnson & Johnson was available. And they've already vaccinated more than 500 individuals. It's actually much tougher to do it in a rural environment because you have to drive a long distance between homes. Uh, you wouldn't have such a problem here in New York. But uh, I, I also appreciate you mentioning the resources that are already in place, nonprofits which are already going door to door, either to deliver food. I'm wondering if you've talked to any of the great networks um, that are already going door to door about uh, being activated for, for vaccination and whether there's interest there. Yes, we have talked to all of them, particularly those that started during this god awful pandemic. They have current lists and they are willing to do it. And obviously, as you heard earlier from your wonderful testimony, it would be good to make sure that the individuals who go door to door also get vaccinated, um, uh, whether they're delivering uh, from the truck or as some do, uh, indivisibles and certainly those from mutual aid door to door on their bicycles or whatever, they need to get vaccinated also. You should know San Antonio, Corpus Christi, Seattle, and Albany, New York have just done what Vermont does, just FYI. Exactly. So yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chair Chen, did you have, I think you had a question as well, correct? No, I just wanted to, uh, you know, thank the borough president for her leadership on this and her task force. And, and we know the infrastructure is there. The city has it. We just got to get it done. Yep. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair Holden, any questions? No, I just want to thank uh, the borough president again for speaking out. And uh, and I, I agree. Uh, we have senior centers and uh, we have to use them. And uh, certainly, uh, like the Meals on Wheels, that's, that's another outlet. So I agree 100%. <laughs> with the borough president and uh, we should be upgrading our technology which she had advocated 
for, uh, for from the beginning. So I, I just want to thank her again. Thank you all. Thank you, Borough President, for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome our next panel for testimony. In order, I will be calling on Reed Vreeland, followed by Kimberly J. Smith, followed by Jacqueline Kilmer, followed by Marie Mangian, followed by Lindell Urbano. Reed Vreeland, you may begin when you are. Time starts now. Um, hello, thank you, uh, Chair Levine, Chair Chin, Chair Holden, and the, the City Council Committees on Health, um, Aging and Technology, and all the Council uh, Committee staff. Um, I'm, my name is Reed Vreeland. I work at uh, Housing Works um, on, in, in the Advocacy Department. Um, I'm here today uh, to talk about something that has not been discussed, but will have an extremely large impact on the COVID response and on um, HIV, um, on hepati viral hepatitis, homelessness, and uh, racial uh, inequities. Um, what I'm, I'm today ta asking um, the council to pass and vote support resolution 1529, uh, which calls on the New York state legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation to protect New York state's safety net providers and HIV special needs plans by stopping the Medicaid pharmacy carve out currently set for April 1st. So that date is just coming straight at us. As we know by what's happened with the nursing homes, the state department of health has uh, made serious uh, mistakes in terms of policy. It is essential for New York City Council members to weigh in on decisions made at the state level that will harm our city's health care safety net. The Medicaid pharmacy carve out will be catastrophic for 4.3 million managed care Medicaid members who will face disruptions and service cuts. The Medicaid pharmacy carve out will lead to the loss of over 700 healthcare jobs and will strip more than $100 million in annual 340B savings away from safety net providers like community healthcare centers like Housing Works, Apicha, Callan Lord, uh, Charles B. Wang Community Health Center, all of the, the neighborhood community health centers that serve your constituents. Um, I urge the council to pass this resolution um, and support the Godfrey Rivera delay bill uh, in the res that's mentioned in the resolution by the chairs of the, the Assembly and Senate uh, health committees. Um, there are more than 70 community health centers in the state uh, with over 800 locations. Each, uh, Housing Works is a vaccination site, and our vaccination efforts are are almost entirely supported by the 340B savings, which is a, a federal 340B program. The state has is doing a money grab and is trying to balance the budget on the backs of our most vulnerable neighborhoods and communities. Um, Housing Works and the patients we serve will lose at least 8 million in 340B savings annually. This will be extremely disruptive to programs, including um, relating to HIV, um, viral hepatitis, clinical uh, and nursing services, uh, and COVID vaccination. Um, so I urge the council member to look closely at this resolution protect your neighborhood health centers, um, protect uh, the HIV special needs plans that do extremely important work and prevent a, a, an absolutely catastrophic um, uh, implementation of an, a very ill-conceived um, Medicaid pharmacy carve out. This carve out um, will um, will be extremely devastating 
to all of all of the Medicaid members who um, have have been um, having you know knowing exactly how they're going to get their prescriptions, having a certain range of services available. And as of April 1st, um, all of that's going to change and it's going to be very disruptive. Um, so I uh, will give time to my other panelists who from other organizations to talk about this same issue. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Kimberly J. Smith to testify. You may begin with. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you chairs for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. My name is Kimberly Smith and I'm with Cal and Lord uh, Community Health Center. We are a federally qualified healthcare center that primarily serves the LGBTQ community and is open to all regardless of ability, ability to pay. I'm testifying today in support of Resolution 1529, which calls upon the legislature and the governor to pass legislation that will protect safety net providers and special needs plans by eliminating the Medicaid pharmacy carve out. Transitioning the Medicaid pharmacy benefit from managed care to fee for service will eliminate the mechanism that enables safety net providers like Kellen Lord to receive revenue generated by the federal drug discount program known as 340B. 340B resources are the foundation for our safety net and are critical to achieving public health goals and addressing health inequities. 340B resources have far reaching impacts for our clinic and our patients. Consider the homeless patient who connected with Town Lord at an outreach event where he tested positive for HIV. He was disengaged from healthcare. The outreach worker he met that day persuaded him to come to the clinic where he was able to see a nurse, a case manager, and uh, eventually a primary care physician. Later, he was actually diagnosed with hepatitis C. But with the care and the referrals Calendor provides, he was housed, he was linked to care, and today he is virally suppressed and has been treated and cured of hepatitis C. In early 2020, he was living safely in his own apartment and holding down three jobs until the pandemic hit when he lost all three of those jobs and his apartment. And if that was not enough, he tested positive for COVID-19. Our nurses helped him with his COVID diagnosis. And once again, we were able to refer, refer him so that he could find a place to stay. He's back at one job and is now eligible for the vaccine. He trusts us and he's ready to receive it. The Medicaid pharmacy carve out will result, result in a loss of $12 million annually at Kellen Lord, $250 million loss across the state. It will impact thousands of our patients' lives like the one I just described. Furthermore, many of the people who helped this patient along the way from the outreach worker to the triage nurses are supported with 340B resources and their jobs are threatened. The Medicaid pharmacy carve out will cost New York City and state far more than it's gonna save. Please pass resolution 1529. I will uh, email a lengthier version of this testimony. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Jacqueline Kilmer to testify. You may begin. Time starts now. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Resolution 1529 today. I'm Jacqueline Kilmer and I'm the CEO of Harlem United. Harlem United is a covered entity under the federal 340B drug discount program. If the pharmacy carve out is implemented, we will lose approximately a million and a half to $2 million annually in 340B savings that we reinvest into our programs to provide essential services for those in our care. This is money that cannot be replaced from other sources. 75% of the patients Harlem United serves are homeless. The savings that we have access to through the 340B program pays the salaries of outreach workers who go into the community to engage and help retain and care the very transient population we serve. These same staff are now playing a critical role in helping with the registration process for our COVID-19 vaccination clinic. It pays for patient navigators who track patients lost to care and help connect patients to all of our services. It also pays for a jitney driver who transports patients from shelters, SROs, soup kitchens, and other locations to our clinics for appointments. It helps pay for our women's holistic health program, which is critically important to the West African women immigrants we serve who are in need of specialized gynecological and other women's health services. 
It helps to pay for our COVID-19 vaccination clinic. While administration of the vaccine itself is reimbursable, all of the time necessary to outreach and educate our patients and the community we serve about the vaccine and to build the trust and confidence necessary for the communities we serve to be vaccinated is not reimbursable. The carve out puts the lives of thousands of New Yorkers at risk. I'd like to share just one story of one of Harlem United's patients. His story reflects the importance of the existing care coordination between patient, doctor, special needs plan, and pharmacist that will no longer be in place if the carve out is implemented. Anthony was sick and becoming resistant to the medication he was taking to control his HIV. He came to his doctor who prescribed another medication, but timing was critical. He immediately went to the pharmacy, but was told that they couldn't fill his prescription because they had already filled a prescription for him for a similar medication. He tried to explain the situation to no avail. He called his doctor at Harlem United. The doctor immediately called Amidacare, Anthony's health plan. They understood the issue, knew Anthony's health record, and contacted the pharmacy to settle the issue. All of this happened within minutes while Anthony was still at the pharmacy. The pharmacist told Anthony his new medication would be ready in a few minutes. Anthony was able to leave with his new medication. Anthony's message to the governor and to the state legislators has been, under your plan, Governor Cuomo, I would have to call a 1-800 number with thousands of other people and wouldn't have been able to speak to anyone for a couple of days to explain the issue. And then I would have had to wait a couple more days for the issue to be resolved and to get the right medication. You know how much red tape there is in government. By that time, I wouldn't have needed any medication. So Governor Cuomo and state legislators, how much is my death and the death of others worth? Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Marie Mangion to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you to the council for hosting this hearing today. And thank you especially to council members Levine and Lewis for introducing resolution 1529, urging the New York state legislature and governor to reject the Medicaid pharmacy carve out that is slated to take effect statewide on April 1st. My name is Marie Monjon, and I'm the Director of Policy for Chicanies. We're the Statewide Association for Community Health Centers. I sit before you today to urge the Council to pass Resolution 1529 to ensure that the healthcare safety net will continue to operate in its current and vibrant form. If pushed forward as planned, the pharmacy benefit carve-out will have immediate consequences for covered entities under a little-known federal program, that is the 340B drug discount program. This program established by Congress allows safety net providers like health centers to purchase drugs at a reduced price. Health centers and other covered entities are required to use those savings to provide services or even direct financial support for individuals and communities that without those 340B dollars would not have another source of care. You've heard from many of my colleagues today about the losses their health centers would endure if the carve out is implemented. Chikanis has calculated that across the health center network, our health centers alone will stand to lose $100 million annually. For my members, these dollars enable them to provide free or extremely low cost drugs like insulin or EpiPens to uninsured and underinsured people. They use these funds to stand up food pantries in their clinics or hand out public transportation vouchers to those that need them. They provide funds to cover all or part of a family's housing or utility costs. And most importantly, right now, these dollars are supporting the absolutely critical work of COVID-19 vaccination campaigns. We know that any vaccination campaign that prioritizes speed over equity will not reach into the communities that have most been harmed by COVID-19. Those that are black, brown, Asian, immigrant, low income, and seniors. If the state moves forward with the pharmacy benefit carve out and removes the 340B program benefits, those communities will once again take the hit. It is unfathomable for the state to move forward with implementing the carve out during the most unprecedented health crisis in modern history, perhaps tied only with the HIV epidemic. The incredible irony is that reversing the pharmacy benefit carve out will not only harm our efforts to beat COVID-19, but it will also undermine our state's gains towards ending the HIV epidemic. Resolution 1529 calls on the legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation that would delay the pharmacy carve out for three years for health centers, Ryan White clinics and special needs health plans. 
Doing so will give us the needed time to discuss appropriate measures and safeguards for moving forward if a carve out is the correct course of action for the state to take. We believe it is not. The council will be in good company if you pass okay. resolution 1529. We urge you to join health centers, Ryan White clinics, disproportionate chair hospitals, community-based organizations, the NAACP, faith leaders, community organizers, and most importantly, our patients and clients to call on the governor and the legislature to reverse the pharmacy benefit carve out. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Lindell Urbano to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Okay. Hi, my name is Lindell Urbano. I'm the Director of Public Policy at Amedicare. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. So Amedicare is a Medicaid HIV special needs plan. Uh, we work with people living with HIV, people who are transgender, and people who are homeless regardless of their HIV status. Um, and to tell you a little bit about who, who we serve, we, we have about 8,500 members who are all New York City residents. Um, and they're all being adverse, adversely affected by both HIV and the COVID. They are black and brown people and people uh, of other Asian and minority backgrounds with, who have multiple health conditions um, who are really ex at risk because they of the fund fundamental inequity that exists in their communities, lack of housing, lack of healthcare access, poor access to food and numerous other factors. Um, unfortunately, we're aware of 250 of our members who, who have had COVID and 35 of them have died. So we serve a population that's heavily affected by this and we're deeply troubled by New York State's attempt to change the way our members get their access to their medications. This pharmacy carve out will hurt, without doubt, hurt New Yorkers and hurt the most vulnerable New Yorkers. And um, that this would go into effect by April 1st is really troubling. We work hand in hand with community health centers. In fact, we were founded by community health centers to serve people living with HIV. And we, so the, the providers who spoke before me work for some of these community health centers. And we're able, because we have that close community uh, connection, we're able to really look at each member individually and look at what their pharmacy utilization, we know their medical records, we talk to their providers, and we're able to get them the care they need when they need it without delay and problem solve in the moment. And that's a huge deal. And the state's plan to, to, to uh, carve the pharmacy benefit out would change that. It would undermine all of our attempts. Uh, I won't go over the story that Jackie shared earlier, but that's a perfect example of it. The fact that the patient was able to go into the pharmacy, call their provider who was able to contact them and they were able to get their medication in minutes is incredible. And re it's something we cannot afford to lose. Under the carve out, they would lose that. They would call that 1-800 number and be waiting for days. It's, it makes no sense because the patient's gonna end up in the emergency room and cost the state more. You know, we don't want that. Um, so in conclusion, I wanna reiterate the call to pass resolution 1529 I'm as soon as possible. Um, and I'll just end by saying thank you for this opportunity to testify and for really taking these issues so seriously and for taking action on them. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now turn it to Chair Questions, starting with Chair Levine. Well, thank you so much to this panel. And I don't have time to talk about how important these four or five, but the four direct service providers that spoke are Medicare, Callan Lord, Housing Works, Harlem United, I mean, you, you, you are an essential part of the healthcare system of this city. And you exist in part because there are people that you need to serve and care for who are not, were not, would not get adequate care in the mainstream medical system. You play a critical, often life-saving function for them. And you're able to do that in part because of the funding that comes in through the pharmacy benefit carve out. And so 
I'm just adamant in joining you and your call that this carve out must be eliminated. We're not looking for it to be pared back. We're looking for it to be eliminated. And as Reed mentioned, the clock is ticking. Uh, we're alarmingly close to the date at which this will um, take effect and will have really a brutal impact on your organizations and more importantly, on the people that you're caring for. So I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that we are stepping up now in the council to, um, to go on record, uh, taking a stand against this carve out through this resolution, uh, 1529. And you have my full support and I think a large number of my colleagues in the body in this fight. And we're, we're talking to our colleagues at the state level, but um, the stakes here are really high. And as all of you mentioned uh, very powerfully, this would be a bad idea at any time, but to cut this funding in the middle of a pandemic is a spectacularly bad idea that will hurt some of the people who were already disproportionately bearing the brunt of COVID. So we just can't do it. Um, I guess I'm not really asking a question, making a statement, uh, but I wanna thank everyone who spoke on this and want you to know that you have my full support. Thank you, Chair Levine. Uh, Chair Chin, any questions? Okay, Chair Holden. No, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to thank this panel for their testimony, and we, we're we gonna now move to the next panel. Um, in order, I'm gonna be calling on Christian Gonzalez Rivera, followed by Noel Hidalgo, followed by Brianna Padden-Williams, followed by Judith Levin, followed by Rachel Sharrow, followed by Myung Lee. Christian Gonzalez Rivera, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Christian Gonzalez Rivera and I'm the Director of Strategic Policy Initiatives at the Brookdale Center for Healthy Aging. Uh, we're CUNY's Aging Research and Policy Center and a part of Hunter College. Uh, so thank you uh, to Chairs Levine, uh, Chin and, and Holden and the members of the committees for holding this, this oversight hearing. Um, as the council is well aware, older people of color and older immigrants have had the least access to vaccine appointments. That's something that, you know, thankfully, I mean, it's like has been well discussed um, at this and other hearings. And as has been discussed, the main culprits are a lack of organized vaccine education in advance of the start of vaccination, as council member Barron mentioned, uh, the lack of trusted messengers like personal doctors, right now advising their patients to get the vaccine and helping them to do so, which is critical. And of course, the, the largely online process for getting appointments. So to reverse the trend of disparity in the, in the COVID-19 vaccination, we would like to outline for the council um, a four-step plan for ensuring that older New Yorkers of all socioeconomic levels take the rightful place uh, in line for the vaccine. And I was happy to hear, in fact, that you know several elements of this were already mentioned in today's hearing. So the first is already underway, um, as Chair Chin and the commissioners have mentioned, and that is taking the vaccine to where older adults are. You know, the New York City Command, uh, Vaccine Command Center should speed up that process, you know, uh, which is, I mean, identifying the vaccine points of distribution, the pods, um, in places that already serve older adults. And so this includes senior centers, NORCs, uh, 202s, and other senior housing buildings, um, locations that already meet the requirements from the Vaccine um, uh, Command Center should be informed as soon as possible so that they can make preparations. And those that are close to meeting the requirements should receive recommendations on how to meet those requirements as soon as possible. And again, done well in advance so that um, they're ready when the, the uh, supply of vaccine is, is, is expanded. Second, push medical uh, providers to vaccinate their patients and to provide information. Every healthcare provider in the city should be calling each of their patients age 65 and above and offering to help them set up an appointment for the vaccine. As Dr. Chakshi, uh, Chakshi himself said, a person's own doctor is an important trusted messenger. And some providers are already doing this, but it's far from universal. And in particular, smaller providers, public hospitals, and other safety net medical facilities without the capacity to do so should be able to tap into H&H's test and trace core to make phone calls and do follow-ups. So, I mean, this is capacity that we already have there. It should be connected directly to medical providers as being trusted messengers. Um, and, and of course, as, as we know, the public hospitals and safety net facilities are more likely to serve the lower income people who need access to this vaccine. Third piece of the, uh, of the plan, serve the homebound through existing trusted delivery infrastructure. 
and this is something that council member Traeger and others have mentioned. Um, you know, the, uh, the soon to be released Johnson and Johnson vaccine is especially good. Required. Um, but in advance of the release of that of the vaccine, the city should be preparing to activate its network of uh, trusted providers. So as uh, Borough President Gail Brewer said, this includes Meals on Wheels, um, as, well as, as well as the tens of thousands of home care uh, and personal care workers who already serve homebound older adults. And the very last um, piece of the plan is, and this is important as well, to set up a hotline for caretakers to summon a vaccinator. So basically in order to further support homebound older adults, the city should set up a hotline uh, that allows formal or informal caretakers to make an appointment for a vaccinator to visit the person's home. There should be a major public awareness campaign to advertise this service and all entities providing vaccinators should communicate the safety and fraud prevention protocols that will be in place uh, to ensure that homebound older adults uh, remain safe. So we feel like all four of these are critical to reaching the homebound and already disadvantaged populations that are being left out through the vaccine distribution effort. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Noel Hidalgo to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. I'm sorry, I think you're muted. Um, you may have to accept the unmute yeah hello hi thanks sorry about that um thank you council members for all of your thoughtful comments uh, and thank you uh borough president brewer for including beta nyc as a member of the manhattan vaccine task force um i have a mixture of uh, prepared remarks um I, but i'm going to stray from them i will submit them as written testimony um i'm really appalled by some of the testimony that was provided a little bit earlier um to me this is a personal issue i'm puerto rican i have a pulmonary disease i have spent the last year mourning the loss of friends and their family members and for the last six weeks, I've been saying the exact same thing. Digital technology is a critical tool on how government services are delivered in the 21st century. And now we are watching in real time what a massive government technology and design failure looks like. It is insulting that this administration has willfully sidelined existing government technologists and designers who sit inside of the mayor's office and refusing to employ them furthers the digital divide and perpetuates racism, ageism, and ableist mentality. No technology tool can replace poor or missing leadership. The rollout of these websites is a complete failure of service design. Service design reverse refers to the practice of creating better and understand a better understanding and improving upon programs at any stage. We actually have an office inside of NYC Opportunity, which is the mayor's office of uh, service design um, product lab and studio. Uh, for the last six weeks, we have been begging for them to be pulled into uh, this conversation. On top of that, there is uh, the CTO who has the digital services department, who has, has skilled designers and technologists who could easily triage the poor user experience that we have been seeing across the board. It is absolutely absurd, and I want to make this perfectly clear to every single council member who's on, who's still here with us, um, is that it is absurd that a commissioner single-handedly designs the user interface for a single, like the most important website that this administration has ever put together. And to then say that for six weeks, we are constantly working to improve load issues by not and not recognizing that there are extreme usability issues, which we have been talking about for the last six weeks. And so with the remaining time that I have, what I want to call upon is that um, DMHMH's emergency field operations, which is apparently the entity that's been helping uh, maintain this tool, IT, uh, the subcontractors, MTX, NYC Opportunity Civic Service Design Studio and Product Lab, the CTO's office, and do it, get into the same room and to identify the immediate issues that need to be addressed and fix them. This is not a technology problem. The commissioner said that I'm this excited. is not a technology problem. Um, one last thing um, is that 
Um, frankly, there are tools that are out there as that council member uh, uh, Holden mentioned, uh, NYC Access, which have proven and demonstrated capabilities to meet vulnerable New Yorkers user interface needs. These are tools that have been tested and tested and tested. They should be employed today to, uh, to bridge this digital divide. With that, I will conclude my testimony and submit everything else in written form. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Brianna Patton Williams to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hello, I'm Brianna Patton Williams, the Communications and Policy Associate at Live On New York. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Live On New York's members include more than 100 community based nonprofits that provide core services which allow New Yorkers to thrive in our communities as we age. The COVID 19 pandemic has swept across New York, creating a rippling effect, exposing the current political, economic, and social gaps that impact older New Yorkers. These must be confronted both as we continue to respond to the pandemic, but in undertaking the mass vaccination effort. Today, we have the opportunity to bring this life saving vaccine to thousands of older. New Yorkers and slow down the pandemic in its tracks. Yet despite eligibility for older people 65 and older, we continue to see the gaps and inequities as access to the vaccine remains nearly impossible for many. The time is now to commit to older New Yorkers and remove the barriers that have pushed out communities. To ensure a more equitable distribution of the vaccine moving forward, Live On New York recommends the city works in coordination with community-based organizations that are often sources of trust for more marginalized populations. Move away from an over-reliance on technology and ensure information is available across all languages. Monitor and improve the vaccination registration process and make a clear vaccine eligibility of senior service professionals. Now is the time to create an efficient and equitable vaccination plan that ensures no one is left behind and all New Yorkers can safely age in their communities. Older New Yorkers who have stayed home for extended periods of time to remain safe from the, from the virus need a clear plan guided by science as to when it will be safe to re-engage with the community services they know and love. Many spent the summer a period of low transmission risk hoping their local senior center would open one day, not knowing if this would be the case or why it would not be the case if restaurants, gyms, bars, and other services could resume operation. These individuals and the professionals that serve them deserve clarity, transparency, and the comfort of knowing their services are prioritized and guided by science as New York emerges from this crisis. Live On recommends a plan to be created jointly by the Department of Health and Mental Health and DIFTA. And this plan should be balanced against the fact that in addition to the risk of COVID-19, the impacts of isolation also pose considerable risk to older adults. Be guided by the fact that older adults are not a monolith experience the, experiencing the risk of COVID-19, but an age cohort spanning multiple decades of significant variations in overall health and risk level quantify the health indicators that will be needed to meet in order to resume in-person senior services, including services at senior centers and NORCs. In addition to such a plan, providers must be fully reimbursed for cleaning and other costs incurred to ensure safety upon the resumption of each service. I'm we appreciate expired. the consideration of the recommendations and look forward to working with the city to reauthorize in-person senior services at an appropriate time. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Judith Levin to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you to committee chairs Levine, Chin, and Holden, and members of these city council committees for this opportunity to discuss COVID-19 and seniors. I'm Judy Levin, Director of Senior Center Services at Greenwich House, a settlement house based in Greenwich Village, where we've been providing a range of services to our immediate community for over 117 years. As relevant to this issue, we have four senior centers located throughout the village and Tribeca, as well as mental health and cultural services, particularly focused on supporting older adults. Um, to start, we echo the calls here today for partnering with senior centers in the vaccine distribution process. And to state the obvious, the COVID-19 vaccine rollout has presented significant obstacles and challenges for seniors throughout New York City. 
Our most basic challenge stems from the well-documented hesitancy and skepticism around the vaccine, whether due to lack of confidence in this unknown or the lack of trust stemming from the long-standing inequities in the healthcare system. We've worked to address this challenge through outreach calls focused on providing information and resources provided by DIFTA and others. We've also held two Zoom town halls facilitated by Greenwich House Health Services Division staff to share scientific findings and to respond to questions in a safe and trusted environment. Additionally, we continue to try to address the well-reported challenges of helping members and the public navigate the logistics of the online and phone vaccine signup systems. From the disconnects discussed here today due to the multiple websites, each requiring different sets of information to be entered, along with different information needed to secure an appointment, seniors and even those with family members to assist are discouraged and unable to continue with this process. In terms of suggested and recommended solutions to some of these challenges, we support Council Members Levine call for the much needed creation of a unified multilingual portal for booking vaccines. We would also suggest providing senior center operators with a specific number of vaccine appointments each week through partners in our community, which would allow for bulk scheduling. For our part, we along with others are in the process of creating a program of navigators to assist seniors with the process from start to finish helping them to secure appointments and provide information about documentation needed for the process as well as linkages to transportation. While we are piecing together this with existing staff and volunteers, the availability of micro grants would allow programs like this to bring in part-time staff to quickly build capacity and organize and expand efforts. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Rachel Sharao to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, thanks to all the chairs and most especially Chair Chin for her unwavering support um, and compassion for our older adults throughout New York City. I don't wanna waste any time. I can give my time back to my colleagues. I do wanna thank them all for reiterating what we in the field um, no, um, we're, uh, we're the underappreciated local not-for-profit network um, and we have a lot of experience. We have the Meals on Wheels um, delivery trucks that uh, Borough President Brewer spoke about. We can utilize those. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, uh, no pun intended. We also have the access. We know where these folks live. We also have the cultural competency in our local senior centers, which can be opened as pop-up vaccine sites where people are trusted, where, where communities know um, and uh, have, have worked with them for years and years. What we need is we need outreach, we need education in order to uh, do exactly what council member Barron said and really make people feel safe. There has to be a messenger, whether it's the, the local, uh, local practitioner or their senior center, somebody they trust and understand the efficacy of this vaccine and how important it is for all of us. Um, we don't need to rely on the J&J &J vaccine. We haven't had a timeline of when we're going to get it. And if we do have a date, then let's start setting up the appointments. Um, as some of my colleagues have said, we need to continue to uh, beat the drum on, on this. The homebound recipients that we serve, the 20,000 are among the most vulnerable population in this city. Getting a daily nutritious meal is so uh, important to them and will create the balance for the efficacy of this vaccine. I also wanna reiterate the essential workers who have been working tirelessly day in and day out from day one of this um, pandemic. The Meals on Wheels delivery staff need to be vaccinated. There needs to be education there. There need to be pop-up sites at their uh, centers where they work. And we need to make sure that they're safe as well. I thank you very much for the time. And I look forward to all of us working together on this. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Myung Lee to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you and good afternoon council members. And I really wanna thank uh, committee chairs Levine, Chen and Holden for holding this important hearing. 
My name is Myung Lee, and I'm the president and CEO of Volunteers of America Greater New York, a human services organization that provides shelter, housing, and support to almost 12,000 clients every year, including 2,000 older adults. When community centers closed due to COVID, we immediately found alternate sources for meals for our clients. And our older adults who are afraid of going out and getting sick, our staff, we take care of them by having the staff run errands for them. And one of, when one of our clients got sick recently, we did everything to ensure that he would get well, including running errands to the pharmacy and even getting him his favorite chicken soup from a local restaurant. Our supportive housing residences and single room occupancy units serve the majority of our 2000 older adult clients. And while the SROs are not technically a NORC or our senior residents, we serve and house many older adults who should be prioritized to receive vaccines on site. Recently, we've launched a campaign to encourage our clients to get the COVID vaccine, but we're finding the problem of under enrollment for the vaccine is as much about concrete practicalities as it is about resistance or fear of the vaccine. Most of our older adults don't have the skills or the technology needed to book a vaccine online, and a great majority of our clients struggle with mobility issues that make them essentially homebound. If, we're to vaccinate, if we are to vaccinate our seniors against COVID-19, the city must bring the vaccines to them. And that includes the SROs and the shelters and the, and the residences where our clients are. It's simply impractical as well as dangerous for us to not do so. We also need healthcare professionals to provide vaccine education on site ahead of time. Smartphones and tablets are required for telehealth and other medical appointments and to keep those at risk of depression and social, social isolation connected to family. And last but not least, we need many more affordable supportive housing units that are appropriate for seniors as our SROs are becoming NORCs. At a new affordable housing complex for seniors that Volunteers of America Greater New York is opening in the next month, we received over 23,000 applications for 87 available units. Clearly, there's a need. Thank you again for holding this important hearing and I look forward to working together with all of you to better support our older New Yorkers during this pandemic and beyond. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now turn it to the chairs and any council members for questions. Chair Chin. Yeah, I really wanted to um, thank this panel and thank all the, the advocacy that you do and, and the, the seniors that you take care of and all the great work that you've been doing you know, during this uh, pandemic and your recommendation. I mean, that's what we're fighting for. And I hope the administration help, you know, make sure that you're part of um, the team that will get this ready. Um, it's a no brainer that the infrastructure is there. We just got to get uh, the vaccine, which we hope will be coming soon. I do have one question for Zed Uh When the uh, commissioner Trish was testifying, she was talking about this group that I was curious about. And I didn't get a chance to ask her, Salesforce? Um, is that some group that the city contract with to do the, the, the website and all the testing? So um, I'm not exactly sure what contract she was mentioning, um, but what, what we've been able to discover is that um, Department of Health uh, put out a contract with a, a company called MTX. Um, and MTX oh, yeah. uh, has been uh, providing services um, and essentially uh, um, what would be reskinning or reselling access to Salesforce. And so Salesforce is uh, a pretty massive online database used for a number of different types of uh, transactions. You know, sometimes it's customer support. Uh, we've seen Salesforce enter into the healthcare space recently. Um, and essentially they're just the, the reliable database um, that MTX has essentially put a front end on. Um, our biggest concern um, from the testimony that um, the commissioner presented um, was one, uh, she admitted to single-handedly designing the user interface, which we know that there are experienced user interface designers inside of city government. And I think it's 
unbelievable that a commissioner would sit there and, and design a user interface when um, uh, there are other people who have had that profession for uh, decades. Uh, two is that she talked about load testing and had difficulty answering about user testing. Um, and that's a difference between load testing, which is about reliability and user testing, which is about usability. Um, I now fall is into a qualified category. Um, I go to the VAX site, vax4nyc.gov. I can see that I can schedule a first dose. I now have been spending 20 minutes clicking on every single day to find out when is there a vaccine availability. And this is absurd because if somebody um, had properly gone through the user design of this particular website, once you get through the qualification stage, it should immediately list out what are all the appointments that you can make. And so to me, the most um, kind of like scary part of that testimony is that these websites are not being done. They're not being user tested, um, A, and then they're not being user tested with any of the vulnerable communities that are out there, whether you um, are in a senior, whether you, um, you are now qualified mm -hmm. for some type of vision disability, uh, um, a vision limit uh, limitation, uh, various abilities, uh, different languages, because we all know that, you know, like in my communities, there's Puerto Rican Spanish, but then there's also South American Spanish based upon what country you're coming from. And these terms are using fairly technical terms. And so what type of usability testing is being done that's identifying these very concrete things that should be changed? Um, and then how are those changes being implemented? Um, so to answer your question, Salesforce is just the database. Uh, but there are many more questions to be asking of how this is being implemented. No, thank you. I think the, the, the issue that you raised earlier about the using the expertise that's already exists in government from the other department, and it seems like there is no internal coordination. I remember the last hearing uh, that we had with, that, uh, with uh, Chair Holden on senior and technology, uh, do it wasn't there, and you have a uh, chief technology officer uh, from the mayor's office. And that just doesn't seem to be um, the coordination and working together. And that is the biggest problem because I think with the, um, the providers here, are, are you contacted by the vaccine command center or by DIFTA? Are, are you being consulted on how you can help? Like Rachel, you got the, the Meals on Wheels program, 20,000 seniors. Homebound, are you included in that homebound plan that the mayor was talking about? Oh, Rachel, yeah. She's, she's muted, yeah. Oh. Yes, yeah, okay. I, um, the task force that was created three weeks ago, as if we didn't know that this year long pandemic was Only eventually going to come. Ago? Right. I mean, I, I, you know, it's been a long hearing, so I'm just going to tell the truth. Yes, this has been a very frustrating experience because we haven't, just like from the beginning, Get Food was created a parallel system. We could have included senior centers initially. I mean, we've been working so closely with Greenwich House to feed so many of their clients. We, we you know, we did that because we all work together. That's not how this should be, work, how this should happen. Uh, to Noel's point, we, we should all be involved. We're the ones who have the, the experience in the field. Yeah. We're the ones who are trusted. We're there every day uh, with the community members. So, you know, I'm sorry, what was your question, Chair? Now, I want to make sure that you are you included in the, the city's plan for. Um, I think the city has their own plan. Yet? I think the city has their own plan and they'll tell us when they, they want to implement it. And I don't think they're interested in hearing input, certainly from me, maybe from others. Well, we're going to we're going to keep on pushing uh, because it's really unconscionable because I think for the senior. The best way is to give them a call and the senior centers are already doing that. And your program is already doing that. You have the contact, you know where they are and they trust you and you're doing the wellness call already. So you could just help them make the appointment and it could be done because over this weekend, that's what happened on, on one of the site, uh, Hamilton Medicine now. They call over 400 seniors and they got them appointment and it went smoothly. 
I mean, that's the experience that we want the seniors to have. Instead of going crazy through the website or the hotline that don't have, don't speak their language. And I think we, we just got to continue uh, to advocate to make sure that um, the senior service providers are included and they should support what you do. And we want to get the centers open. Um, okay. I'm going to pass it on to uh, Chair Holden. Yes. Uh, thank you, my co-chair, for fighting for our seniors. And you, you've done this for quite some time. And I just want to echo what you just said. Uh, my mom at one point received uh, Meals on Wheels, and she would look forward to talking to the delivery people. Uh, she developed a relationship with them. She trusted them. And uh, I would, I would, you know, walk in sometimes to her apartment and, and hear the conversation. And it was, you know, she, my, my mom was shut in and she welcomed, uh, obviously, people that she knew. And she trusted the senior center that she visited also. So to not use this, this like, like you said, Chair Chen, it, to not use this infrastructure um, is really so disappointing. And the, we know the mayor's, uh, mayor has uh, some kind of plan. We haven't heard it. But if he, if he doesn't, his administration does not talk to this panel, a lot of the people on this panel, about how to, how to deliver the vaccine to uh, seniors and how to, how to get their trust then it, it, it's, um, again, it's, it's almost criminal because people are dying and we need to really trust our senior centers and Meals on Wheels program. So I wanna thank the, the panel for you know, fighting for, for, for our seniors. But I, I just wanna jump in and ask uh, Noel Hidalgo from Beta NYC. Uh, first thing, I wanna thank you for your service to the uh, N NYC's uh, tech community and advancing tech solutions to address the pandemic. But no, why do you think this, that, that this administration, because we've been talking about how they're not using the tech talent that they have. We, we, we mentioned this last month and we never got an answer. We wrote a letter about it. Um, why do you think, is it a turf war, do you think? Or is it business as usual that they, they don't communicate with one another? Or is it flat out incompetence by the administration? What do you, what's your guess on this? Well, um, seeing that we've been here for hours and we're in the waning days of this particular administration, and I, um, uh, I personally am so frustrated to see my, my professional colleagues inside of City Hall being marginalized uh, for, for months on end, um, really since, since, since March, um, um, I think it is a mixture of, of all of that. Um, some incompetence, some as a turf war, um, and some was just uh, flat out, just um, poor understanding of how do you use service design and technology to address the, the pressing issues in, inside of the 21st century. You know, we very quickly went from meeting in person um, and, and having what, you know, what we would call the, the normal life uh, to being completely remote and being completely dependent upon uh, digital technology to, to stay connected. And, and government has really deprioritized uh, modernization efforts um, uh, for, for decades. Um, you know, there was many high hopes with this particular administration uh, that that would change. Um, you know, the, the mayor's um, friends and internal advisors um, pushed him to create the, the office of the CTO. Uh, we pushed the mayor to formalize MOTA, the mayor's office of uh, data um, analytics to be a, a charter, uh, you know, a, a position that exists in the charter. We were able to update the city's open data law um, you know, he came out strong talking uh, about trying to address the tale of two cities and, and the digital divide. Um, but yet, um, you know, almost immediately out of the same gate, we, we saw the failures of a booking system around IDNYC, which, you know, all of the issues that we're seeing now uh, around trying to get the, the, the vaccine is mirrored from seven years ago of the failure to, to roll out an efficient booking system for IDNYC. Um, and, you know, there, there's a very clear need to reform procurement practices of how technology is proc uh, procured and, and produced, um, and also to reform do it. I mean, it, it, is, it is absurd that we're sitting in a, a situation where there's a lot of innovation around the edges, 
but the hard stuff, which is uh, building a modern uh, technology and service design unit inside of New York City government hasn't been done. Um, and so I look forward to the next administration and those council members who, who um, uh, are part of the, the next council uh, to really take on the, the effort to, to redesign how the city procures bills uh, and builds government services. We're sitting in the 21st century and so much of the stuff is really um, the remnants of the last century. Um, and just in a few more years, we're gonna be in the middle of the 21st century and we're still using technology um, like nyc.gov. I will bring this up as an excellent example. nyc.gov was redesigned 10 years ago. Um, its user interface was refreshed uh, 10 years ago. The underpinnings of that technology tool um, dates back 20, 25 years ago. Uh, if you are uh, familiar with how a folders are organized on your computer, um, that's how nyc.gov is, is organized. It is such a cumbersome infrastructure that community boards don't update their websites. Agencies don't update their websites. It is easier for the Department of Health to share PDFs than actually to publish that information as a website. You know, if you're looking to get and sorry to rant on this, but if you're looking to, to find out what are the testing times, right, what you go to is you go to a website, you click on a link and you download a PDF, which is very much a web app. Why aren't these two things connected? Why isn't there leadership bringing together all of these technology tools so that way we don't have to download a PDF and then use our fingers to open up the PDF and find out exactly how long it takes to get a COVID testing? That is a testament of a failure of leadership and failure to understand how technology can be used in this time of crisis. Right, um, but you, you also heard the Com Commissioner Tish say that she was only brought in to, to work on the website, uh, the, t uh, the vaccine website two and a half weeks ago. So you, you, that right away, they weren't using the talent that they had. Th so. This problem around information technology information dispersal has been a problem since March. There hasn't been clear technology leadership or, or service design leadership um, uh, since March, since this pandemic began. Um, my colleagues inside of the Department of Health um, have talked about a working group. There was a, once a technology and data working group that met prior to the pandemic. As soon as the pandemic hit, that working group was shut down. Um, and we have continued to see all of these inequity issues uh, per, uh, um, pop up because there's been a lack of communication and a lack of coordination on what information should be collected so that way then they can report out um, who's properly being tested and we can see where, where the virus has been spreading. Like there's just been a complete shutdown of leadership. Um, and, and then at the same time, like this micromanaging, uh, which then gets expressed where you have commissioners designing user interfaces instead of employing the actual experts who know how to build user interfaces. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Noel. Thanks so much for your testimony and for your comments today. Thank you, Chair Chen. Thank you, Chairs. Um, I'm gonna quickly ask if there are any other council member questions at this time. Seeing no hands. Seeing no hands, I'm gonna thank this panel for their testimony and we'll be moving on to our next panel. In order, I will be calling on Beth Frankel, followed by Brian Nixindo, followed by Tara Klein, followed by Sharanya Pillai, followed by Michael Garcia, followed by Gemma Marins, followed by Daniel Barkley, followed by Ali Baum. Beth Frankel, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, so uh, I'm Beth Frankel, F-I-N-K-E-L, uh, not on, not on uh, Housewives of New York. Uh, so uh, anyway, um, I represent AARP, I'm the state director. We have over 750,000 members that are 50 and older in New York City, over two and a half million across New York State, nationally, a heck of a lot more than that. And COVID and the way it's been handled for our members 
their families have has really been a tragedy uh, that we have watched unfold and tried to do our very best to advocate to make changes. I feel very, very strongly thanking the three chairs of this committee, Chair Holden, Chair Chen, and Chair Levine for pulling this together because I think it is the three key areas that we need to really coordinate to find out the best solutions to move forward. Um, I really am pleased, you know, across New York State, 95% of all the deaths of COVID have been people that are 50 and older. So we really need to begin to uh, address that because we're just we're not getting down to the 50 year old and, and that's where the numbers are really rising. I'm really pleased to um, hear a number of the initiatives that we've already talked about. Um, we've talked about isolation a lot and, and Chairman Chin, Chin, I really appreciate you bringing that up. Safe opening of senior centers is, is incredibly important. Uh, and um, I want to spend a moment on the homebound because that's something that we've been working on. Uh, we were the first to ask for a homebound plan for the city. Uh, and I, I feel strongly that it needs to be stronger, better coordinated. Uh, and the idea that the Meals on Wheels workers are still not being addressed. These are the people who are going into people's homes. Um, it, it's just unconscionable. Um, I really was pleased, uh, Councilman Levine, when you talked about uh, the door-to-door -door initiative. There's other groups doing it. You're absolutely right. I was really excited to hear you talk about that. The unified scheduling uh, website, that's also something that's very important to us. People should be able to go to one site and get what they need. But again, I know you all emphasize this. The uh, the phone number, the 800 number, the services and the languages available on the 800 are so key and it's so, so been lagging behind, although we continually get promises that it's going to be um, improved. Um, I, I also want to talk about Danique Miller's uh, bill uh, to stop the disparities that are going on. You know, ARP has written four papers on disparities uh, and the 50 plus, the one that we did most recently was LGBTQ and the 50 plus, and we also did one on COVID. If you all haven't seen them, I'll be happy to share them with you again. Just want to assure you that ARP wants to be the very strongest advocate and partner with all the work that you're doing. And I just want to thank you again. You'll have a written testimony with a lot more detail in it. And I thank you for this time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I'd like to now welcome Brian McSindo to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Brian, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, good afternoon, Chair Levine and members of the Committee on Health. I am Brian McIndoe, President and CEO of Ryan Health. I am here to testify in support of Resolution 1529, calling on the New York State legislation to pass and the governor to sign legislation to protect New York State safety net providers and special needs plans by eliminating the Medicaid pharmacy carve out. I am here today on behalf of over 50,000 patients that Ryan Health serves every year, which, of which over 85% of our patients are low income, living at or below 200% of poverty, and at least three fourths of our patients are of color. Our opposition to the pharmacy benefit carve out is rooted in the devastation it would cause to the savings that Ryan Health achieves under the current federal 340B program. We have worked diligently for the last 20 years to make this program benefit our vulnerable patients and to fill the congressional intent of the statute. At Ryan Health, we reinvest our 340B savings into efforts to achieve that intent in the following ways. We subsidize low costs of free medications for low income patients, financing our sliding fee scale for our uninsured patients, supporting mission focused programs that operate at a loss, offering enhanced care coordination for those who are chronically ill, including patients with diabetes and HIV, creating and implementing nutrition and diabetes education programs, and conducting outreach to local community members to bring them into care, addressing racial disparities and inequalities in healthcare access. I would like to share with you a story of just one patient, and you can times this by a thousand, who benefits from our diabetes education program. This patient is, uh, 
receives care at our Ryan Health Dina on the Lower East Side. He is 78 years old and is a very complex patient lived with multiple comorbidities, including diabetes, HIV, high blood pressure, COPD, kidney disease, and cognitive impairment. For years before entering our diabetes management education program, he was not properly taking his medication and easily confused. In the fall of 2019, he became more engaged in his care when our certified diabetes educators imp implemented twice monthly visits or calls with him. While his A1C was as high as 12.6, it has been at goal less than 8% since engaging with the diabetes educator more regularly. He is a clear example that patients who live with complicated medical histories are manageable with long-term and very frequent follow-ups. Importantly, we also know that it is this hands-on intervention and care with the patient that keeps them out of the emergency room and from avoidable hospital admissions that are very costly to the Medicaid program. I testified before you this afternoon with the sovereign knowledge that if this misguided pharmacy carve-out is implemented, it will have a devastating impact on the healthcare safety net in New York State and on patients that I just talked about. The threats to the 340B program mean Ryan Health and Ryan Chelsea Clinton could lose up to $6 million in revenue annually. We could not sustain that loss in funding and would have to eliminate or cut the programs that I just talked about earlier, and also would I have to- fired. We want to applaud and thank Chair Mark Levine for introducing the resolution, calling on the governor and legislation to reverse course on this misguided policy and support the vital work of 340B providers in our communities. I thank you for allowing me to testify today. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Tara Klein to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Thanks, Dr. Now. Thank you, Chairs Chen, Levine, and Holden, and council members for hosting today's important hearing. My name is Tara Klein. I'm a senior policy analyst with United Neighborhood Houses. UNH is a policy and social change organization that represents 44 neighborhood settlement houses in New York. Like most New Yorkers, UNH is thrilled with the growing availability of the COVID-19 vaccine that will lead us out of this crisis, but we remain very concerned with the public rollout of the vaccine, particularly for older adults. Based on conversations with settlement houses who operate senior centers, NORCs, home delivery meals programs, home care agencies, and other community-based services, my written testimony includes a series of recommendations for New York City to improve the vaccination distribution process to ultimately get more older people vaccinated. And now I'll focus briefly on two of those recommendations. First, we need to add more vaccination sites for older adults to get back closer to home and allow more community-based organizations to become sites. Many senior centers and NORCs in the UNH network have expressed strong interest in becoming vaccination sites. Their physical spaces remain empty as activities are indefinitely being held remotely, providing a ripe opportunity to provide vaccinations in a trusted community space where older adults feel comfortable and staff can assist with hyper-local outreach to older adults. We're happy to hear that Mayor de Blasio announced that vaccine clinics will be set up at a few NORCs and HPD senior buildings, and Governor Cuomo's office has also established a number of pop-up vaccination sites in CBOs starting last week, including several settlement houses and NYCHA developments. Still, more organizations are eager to join the effort and become formal sites, yet are having a difficult time communicating their interest to their government contacts. As we ramp up our vaccination efforts, there must be a clear way for CBOs to express this interest in being a vaccine site. And we hope city agencies will work together on such a plan. Next, we need to allow community-based organizations to directly enroll older adults for an appointment. Right now, many older adults are struggling to sign themselves up for appointments and are calling local senior centers and NORCs for help. DIFTA has also instructed programs to make wellness calls to participants to help them sign up. However, these staff are using the same appointment systems as the general public, thus competing with everyone else for appointment times. Much like the former food czar did with the Get Food program, the city should create a trusted enroller program to allow aging services staff to directly enroll people for vaccine appointments. These staff should have a unique system that allows them to bypass the public signup system. A certain number of appointments could be set aside for these staff to schedule each day, or staff could see live appointments that are available. A private hospital in Manhattan is already working with local CBOs, including One Settlement House, on just such a system, and it is going well. We understand that a CBO partnership portal is in development by the city, and it's important that the city test this portal and gather feedback from CBOs before it launch so that the rollout is smooth. And finally, 
Uh, UNH continues to urge DIFTA to delay its pending procurement for older adult centers, which we believe is short-sighted in part given the very real need for the aging services network to give full attention to vaccinating older adults right now. Um, again, my written testimony includes additional recommendations as well as support for council member Traeger's intro 2225. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Sharanya Pillai to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you to Chair Chin, Chair Holden, and Chair Levine for the opportunity to testify today on this pressing matter regarding equity and vaccine access for older adults. I'm Sharanya Pillai, Deputy Director at India Home, the largest culturally competent older adult program dedicated to South Asian immigrant older adults in New York. We have been providing life-saving programs during this time through home-delivered meals and groceries, engaging in informative virtual programs seven days a week, wellness checkup calls to our clients, and test and trace community outreach and vaccine awareness in partnership with NYC h and and DOHMH. For the past year, vaccines have been talked about as a source of hope, the catalyst to moving forward, and the solution to a safer, healthier world. We have been educated on the vaccines and we have educated our communities extensively on the vaccines, answering misconceptions left and right in whatever way we can. However, once the vaccines became available, our clients who should have been prioritized and organizations like ours were left scrambling. Older adults are likely to lack digital literacy and this is especially the case for South Asian immigrant older adults who are also likely to be low income and low English proficient a process being highly dependent on digital literacy to be able to get the vaccine for older adults is in itself inaccessible. Some of our clients don't have internet or any device to be able to access this vaccine booking system. Constantly our clients and we both see the same message from the website that appointments are all booked up in the areas around them. The procedure to book the appointments on the website is complicated and not intuitive in the way that is accessible for older adults. Furthermore, low English proficient older adults face even more barriers in this process. While there is the option to translate the vaccine finder site in Bengali and Urdu, once you click on the site you want to book at, the clients that are low English proficient can't navigate any further. We're swamped with the calls to handle these vaccine appointments for the older adult community across New York City without the given support for us to do this. The procedure takes a long time, which puts a high stress on the limited capacity we have to be able to book appointments on the client's behalf. Imagine when we're asking our oldest of adults for their emails to register online for their vaccine appointment and they say back to us, what is an email? How we became dependent on this website to serve the biggest population of eligibility for the vaccine simply does not make sense. And while the phone line is meant to be an accessible option, this process has proven inefficient and frankly very frustrating, as you all know. There are several other points in which access needs to be addressed including the locations of the vaccine, which are highly lacking, especially in Eastern Queens, where a large older adult population lives. We also need to look at the accessibility of these locations and measures to keep vulnerable se seniors warm during these cold months while getting vaccinated. There needs to be more partnership, as said before, with CBOs like ours to directly provide vaccines to our clients at our locations. We need attention to this matter. Eligibility criteria expanding doesn't mean anything if it's not accessible to those it's expanded to. We have 80 plus year olds calling our office constantly saying they know about the website's existence, but they can't use this website. And it's common knowledge to all of us that this website is inaccessible. We need more to show that South Asian older adults are being included, and this is a matter of life and death. In order for us to get our older communities back to normal, we need accessible locations in the areas where seniors live, we need an imp improved portal or phone line system that is easy to use and efficient. We need direct partnership with older adults serving organizations like ours, and we need more support. And we need more funding to support these programs to continue to help ensure that seniors are vaccinated and that we safely move forward. Thank you for your time and consideration of our requests and giving us the opportunity to testify once again, and we will be submitting a written testimony as well. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Gemma Marins to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Chin, Chair Levine, and Chair Holden for the opportunity to provide testimony. My name is Gemma Marins. I'm a social worker at the Isaac Center, which is a multi-service organization that services seniors in a hybrid Nork Senior Center out of Isaac's Homes Development in the Upper East Side and Taft and Johnson Houses in East Harlem. 
The release of the vaccines is a beacon of hope as for many as, as this pandemic has been incredibly taxing. With the pandemic, social isolation has increased and a large reason for this is the large digital divide that exists for seniors. While efforts are constantly being made to engage seniors in COVID relief efforts and beyond, a lot of it is done virtually and technologically disconnected seniors are often left behind. In total, we work with 1,700 seniors and 79% have indicated that they are interested and ready to take the vaccine. The other 21% have indicated distrust, fear, and not being ready to take the vaccine. And only 65 people have indicated successfully making appointments for the vaccine. At Isaacs, our team works daily to try to make appointments for our seniors. We have Zoom sessions about COVID myth busting and FAQs and share reliable information to help our seniors make informed decisions for themselves. Many have requested or indicated that they wanna get the vaccine at the center because of its centralized location to the neighborhood and their, trust, their trusted relationship they have. For many, they are not comfortable scheduling online or get incredibly defeated spending hours on the phone only to be told that there are no appointments available. Community organizations like ours exist because of the support and trust of the community and, should, and they should be utilized to get New Yorkers vaccinated. Our, set, our center and its satellite location are located near five hospitals in addition to other local health providers and pharmacies that would provide the vaccine. While it is understandable that vaccine availability is limited due to governmental allocation, vaccine sites are popping up around the city, but Upper East Side and Harlem still do not have local appointments and people are still uncomfortable utilizing transportation methods other than walking. We have not been contacted or, um, or mentioned to be a vaccine or testing site. It has been mentioned if you prepare meals on site, you cannot be considered a vaccine site, which disqualifies community orgs that provide meals to our city's most vulnerable. The issue at hand for our seniors is that it would be most ideal to have an enrollment spe system specifically for seniors considering it only took $50 for TurboVax and NYC vaccine list in a few days. We ask if accommodation consideration can be made about the rule regarding vaccine sites disqualification since hospitals and schools also happen to provide meals and are approved vaccine sites. There is a longstanding history of distrust in our, in our country's healthcare system and overwhelmingly our communities of color have been let down and mistreated by this system. We are ready and willing to be a vaccine site for our seniors and we need the steps. Trusted community organizations like Isaacs can help bridge the gap between the community and the vaccine. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Daniel Barkley to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chairpersons Chin, Levine, and Holden, members of the Health, Aging, and Technology Committees for hosting this critical hearing. My name is Daniel Barkley and I am the director of the Elder Law Unit and the Veterans Justice Project at Brooklyn Legal Services. And I'm here to confirm that the issues you have raised, we are regularly seeing with our clients and to also urge support for a proactive orient, outreach oriented approach. Anything less and our most vulnerable seniors will remain unvaccinated. Brooklyn Legal Services helps over 2000 seniors each year with a variety of legal issues. Many of the clients that we serve are the more vulnerable and marginalized in our communities. As the vaccination rollout in New York City has gathered pace and we have begun receiving calls from our clients, we have become increasingly concerned that our senior clients in particular, and indeed all vulnerable and marginalized seniors in Brooklyn and New York City are not being timely vaccinated and are also at significant risk of not being vaccinated at all, in part because the application process is not accessible to them. You have discussed extensively how cumbersome and difficult the current application process is. With this reality in mind, I would like to highlight some of the obstacles that our senior clients face. The first two have also been discussed extensively, but I wanna mention them. First, many of our senior clients do not have computers, internet access, or even smartphones. So their means of access to the application process is severely limited. Second, as has been pointed out, many of our clients do not speak English. And while it is good that the city's portal has translation services, many of the secondary application portals or sites don't. And so access is made more difficult for our clients who don't speak English. Third, a number of our clients either have diminished capacity or have age-related health issues such as hearing loss or vision loss 
that make it almost impossible for them to engage with the application process by themselves. And fourth, many of our senior clients who need help are very isolated as, as Chairperson Chin so eloquently pointed out. They do not have friends or family or the kind of social service support that would be able to take the time to locate a vaccination site and make the application for them. And finally, in addition to these rather practical barriers for many seniors, New York City needs to confront and address the enormous disparity between the rates of vaccination for whites and people of color. What is particularly distressing is that the numbers are most disparate in the senior population in New York City. According to the latest figures that I saw, 47% of the vaccinations for seniors have gone to whites, while only 15% have gone to Latinx, 13% to Asians, and 12% to Blacks. The legislation that you are considering today could be immensely important to begin to address the concerns that we have. And on behalf of our clients, we are desperate for you to do everything within your- I'm expired. To eliminate racial disparities in the distribution of the vaccination and to ensure that all seniors, including those who don't have access to technology, who don't speak English, who don't have a support system, or who have a diminished capacity, do have meaningful access to getting vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Ali Baum to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Ali Baum, a policy counsel at the New York Civil Liberties Union. As the committee's focus on seniors' access to vaccines, it is critical to pay particular attention to which seniors have access to vaccines. So I want to start where my fellow panelists left off which is that New York City is nearly 25% Black, nearly 30% Latinx, and about 14% Asian. And yet half of all New York City residents, age six, or nearly half, sorry, I shouldn't exaggerate, of all New York City residents, ages 65 plus, who have received vaccines and whose race is known, and there's a huge uh, problem with the reporting there too, are white. Only 15% are Latinx, and only 12% are Black, 13% are Asian. By now we're all familiar with the barriers. Everyone has testified to them today. The vast majority of vaccine signups take place online. Although the city has developed a hotline for New Yorkers to make appointments, that phone line is often overwhelmed, frequently only delivers an automated recording that no appointments remain, and moreover only accommodates English and Spanish speakers. An effectively online only registration system specifically disadvantages seniors. Nationwide, half of all adults ages 65 plus do not have home internet access, and one third of that population reported in 2019 that they had never used the internet. Those seniors lucky enough to be internet savvy or to have family or friends who can help much navigate to each provider's website to try to register for one of precious few vaccination slots, often answering the same intake questions over and over again with each new attempt, a time intensive process that favors those who have the advantages of more flexible time and greater internet savvy. Many who've been able to make an appointment face transportation barriers to arriving at that appointment, and when they do arrive, find that none of the workers on site speak their language. City Council can and must fix these problems. We are pleased to see Chair Levine's proposal to require DOHMH to create a unified scheduling system in all designated citywide languages. This is an important first step, but it is not enough because the digital divide remains a persistent barrier. New York City must develop an effective language accessible means for individuals to sign up for vaccination appointments by phone. This call center should also arrange transportation for those who need it. The city began a, has begun pilot programs that give local community groups blocks of vaccine, vaccine appointments to fill with qualifying residents. These programs must continue and must be expanded. In addition, each vaccination site must have staff on site that speak the languages prevalent in their neighborhoods. They must further have access to a language line to provide appropriate and timely translation for those who speak less common languages. And to reduce the need for transportation, the vaccination pods and hubs, particularly those located in low-income neighborhoods, should give priority to local residents. The city must do more to ensure that all seniors are able to access COVID-19 vaccines. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, that concludes this panel. So I'm gonna turn it over to the chairs for questions. Um, Chair Levine.
Chair Chin, any questions? I apologize, I, I was on mute. I'll just, just very quick and then I'll pass it to Chair Chin. I just, I mostly wanna thank all of your organizations for what you're doing for older adults here in New York City. And, um, uh, and, and I guess my question would be whether any of you have looked at the home uh, programs to deliver at vaccination to homebound seniors in other parts of the country and whether there's any models that we can draw on here in designing our program for New York City. Um, Chair, I, I have not personally looked yet, but I'm, I'm eager to, and I know there were some great ideas that came out today. Um, I know Borough President Brewer also mentioned some other places that she had looked at, so um, we're happy to pull some of those resources together and share them back with you. You're still muted. There we go. Thank you. Sorry, we were having a little uh, technical issue here. Um, thank you, Tara, and to all of you uh, for the work you're doing and for fighting for seniors who are getting hit so hard by this pandemic. We've got to have a better solution to get them appointments easily that doesn't require technology. Uh, and we're, we're, we're with you in this fight. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to pass it to Chair Chen, who I'm sure has uh, important comments and questions. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I just want to also thank this panel. And your recommendation suggestion just makes sense. I mean, that, that's what the city should be doing, setting aside appointments for seniors and, and making sure the, the service provider can help senior make the appointment online. And um, I mean, not, just not online, by the phone call. I mean, you're already calling them. So just help them set it up. And um, the representative from the Isaac uh, House yeah, senior centers are ready and willing to participate. We just got to get the administration to feel this urgency that the infrastructure is there and they're ready to help. Just Sorry. get them the vaccine. So I think that's, that, that's really the most critical part. I mean, just like same thing with the Get Food program. They ended up relying on our infrastructure, the senior center and senior provider and CDO to help. Um, get the word out and help senior register. So they should do the same thing with this vaccine. So we will continue to pressure City Hall and I and I thank you for all the, the great work that, that all of you have been doing for our older adult population. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Chen. Chair Holden? Yes, uh, I just wanna thank this panel and I just wanna throw this out there for the panel, maybe, um, the senior centers can get uh, back to the committee to see if they can just um, poll the, um, obviously the clients, your clients and see how many have been vaccinated. And uh, so we can get an idea um, and bring back, uh, bring that to the mayor and say, you know, here's where we have to uh, really open up the senior centers so they could uh, participate in the vaccine uh, as a distribution center. So. Uh, uh, I want to thank the panel again. Thank you, and thank you uh, to all for, for staying on this long. Thank you, Chair Holden. I'm not seeing any other council member questions. I'd like to thank this panel for their testimony. At this time, we've concluded public testimony, but if we have inadvertently missed anyone that has registered to testify and has not yet been called, please use a Zoom raise hand function now, and you will be called on in the order that your hand has been raised. Seeing no hands, I'm going to turn it back to the chairs for closing remarks. Chair Levine. Well, I want to thank everyone who spoke as witnesses on this important topic, on these topics, whether it is doing right by our seniors and other vulnerable communities who need to have these barriers to accessing vaccines removed. We have to do better. Those of you who spoke on the imperative of preventing the Medicaid uh, carve outs that uh, really will do deep damage to vulnerable New Yorkers in the midst of a pandemic. And those of you who spoke up about uh, the unacceptable level of racial inequality and how vaccination has been conducted so far in the city and uh, the, the undeniable need uh, for the city to address it uh, through some of the policies we, had, uh, we, we have 
advocated today. And to, to all of you who spoke today, thank you. And I also wanna offer a special thank you to the staff of this committee and of these three committees uh, who have done such amazing work to prepare for this hearing and to run it today. Thank you. And I'll pass it off to my wonderful co-chairs, starting with you, uh, Chair Chen. Yes, I also wanted to thank everyone uh, for testifying today, for spending your time to help us advocate uh, um, to make sure that um, there is uh, equity uh, in our city for all the communities and also for our older adults. Um, just hearing from the testimony, it's, uh, it's just really unacceptable that there is no coordination um, between the city and the state and the different um, departments uh, across the city. I know there are a lot of hardworking staff uh, that's working at the Vaccine Command Center. Uh, I mean, right now the biggest issue is the supply, but we know that the supply is coming and we have to be ready with the plan in terms of getting the vulnerable population vaccinated. And the infrastructure is there, less utilizing them. And then the, the whole thing about, look, just like get rid of all the uh, eagles and whatever, just work together. It just doesn't make sense that we, as New York City, we cannot even put up a good website or language line with multiple languages. And since we have all the different cultures uh, across the city and utilizing our senior center, senior service provider, they're there. They're there for the older adults, utilize them, get them involved. And I think that we really need the administration to hear it loud and clear that there's gotta be better coordination and enough, you know, with the, the talk about, oh, delay and not enough vaccine. Vaccines are coming, get the plan in place. And we wanna work with you, the council, we wanna be your partner and all the advocates and all the service providers, we're here to help. So just, just get everyone vaccinated so that we can recover our city and we just need everyone to, to work together. So thank you again to uh, Chair Levine, Chair Holden, uh, all the committee staff that work on preparing for this hearing and all the sergeant. Um, thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you, uh, my co-chairs, uh, wonderful co-chairs. It was a great hearing. Uh, I just want to just uh, thank the wonderful staff, but I just hope that the administration starts to listen because after our last hearing um, with my co-chair uh, Chin, we didn't uh, we didn't hear anything. I don't know if uh, your uh, your committee heard anything, but I didn't hear anything that they were thinking about the senior centers using as a vaccine site, which is so important. I think you heard that probably 40 times on this call today that everyone is is on board with that. So we expect hopefully within the next week to hear from the administration that they're going to do it. And if they don't, I think all the senior centers got to get together and we all as a, and the council and hold a hearing again to just, you know, drive that home because this is not just, uh, you know, the council members speaking on a whim or senior centers wanting to, you know, do the best for their clients. This is a matter of life and death. And there's so many things that are going on and the COVID is, is exploding still. And it's, again, the number one target for the COVID is the older population. So that should have been a priority of this administration to use the senior centers, to use the infrastructure, uh, like my co-chairs have said, that already exists to, to deliver the vaccines and, and also to deliver information. If, if people or seniors don't want the vaccine, they should be educated as to how it'll save, it could save their lives, obviously, but where to get it and how to get it and get it as quickly as possible. So I just wanna thank uh, the wonderful committee staff and my co-chairs for a great hearing and all the people, all the people that testified today uh, on behalf of their organizations and for the senior population. Thanks so much. Thank you, Chair Holden, and back to Chair Levine to close the hearing. 
Okay, in this weird pandemic world, I think I have to improvise for gaveling. So we're gonna close this hearing. And thank you all very, very much for joining us. Be safe, everyone. Thank you all. Hearing is now closed out.